Welcome to the CAA 2021 Explore webinar series. Today we have a special extended webinar on infection control post-pandemic in partnership with NEEM. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy. Hi, welcome to the latest in the CAA webinar series. And today is an extended webinar. My name is David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Welcome. Today's webinar topic is infection control post pandemic. Never has the importance of infection control been more prevalent than now as we navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. With this extended webinar, we feature three leading experts in the field of infection control, concluding with an extended Q&A session with the speakers. I hope you join us for that. Our three speakers today are firstly, Edward Johnson. Edward is the co-founder co of UMBO and adjunct senior lecturer for the Facility of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. And he's going to talk to us today about climate, population and disease patterns 2021 and beyond. Following Edward is Mark Rieger. Mark is a occupational hygienist and senior application engineer in the personal safety division at 3M Australia. And today Mark is presenting on an introduction to respiratory fit testing. And finally, we have Peter Collion, infection disease physician and clinical microbiologist at the ACT Pathology and Canberra Hospital. And today Peter is presenting on living with the pandemics. Our first speaker, Edward Johnson, is a health policy researcher. His PhD is focused on digital capacity building in rural and remote communities with an aim to develop sustainable, equitable and person-centered service delivery models in the bush. He now consults on public health policy, is co-founder of UMBRO and an adjacent senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. Ed is interested in the environmental impact that infectious and non-infectious diseases have on communities and human neurodevelopment, particularly relevant in a context of climate shift, emerging infections and non-infectious diseases. Welcome, Ed. G'day, everyone. Thanks for having me along today. Um, my name's Ed Johnson. I'm a public health worker, researcher, advocate uh, by background. I've got a, a fairly eclectic uh, professional background working in uh, anthropology, policy, uh, public health, and clinical speech pathology. So today I'll be talking with you a little bit about how, how climate, population, uh, people and, and disease can interact together uh, from those points of view. So from that anthropological and, and public health kind of point of view. So hopefully that's um, uh, uh, something that you'll be able to get something out of. Um, before I get moving, I wanted to just acknowledge uh, the Wiradjuri people on whose land I'm sitting uh, and talking at the moment, uh, who have a, a really strong tradition of, of healing uh, and, and wellness uh, in their community going back thousands of years. And I wanted to acknowledge um, the the passing down of, of those practices and that knowledge uh, from from their elders uh, past present and emerging and to all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, with us here today and, and on whose land you are sitting as well. Uh, so like I said I've, I've got a, a background in in something uh, in clinical speech pathology which you wouldn't think perhaps um, was very closely related to this stuff but a lot of my work has been uh, with people with mental illnesses and, and neurodevelopmental disorders in the past so I've been interested in the interface between um, humans animals uh, and illness or wellness for a number of, of years and, and what I've come to see over those years is quite a close relationship uh, between pregnancy, early childhood, uh, and the progression of neurodevelopmental disorders uh, through the lifespan. And when, when I say neurodevelopmental disorders, I'm talking about common diagnoses like uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, congenital syndromes, ADHD, uh, intellectual disability, or 
global developmental delay more, more generally. And of course, not all in, uh, emerging diseases or infectious diseases cause uh, or contribute to the development of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and not all the diseases I'll mention today fall into that category. Uh, but there is more and more literature uh, showing uh, the close link between some of the um, in utero or viral or bacterial infections um, uh, or early childhood viral or, or bacterial infections uh, and the incidence of, of neurodevelopmental disorders diagnosed later on. Uh, so beyond the, the immediate effects of uh, an infectious disease on an individual, there, there are now uh, known consequences for, for continuing um, our development throughout childhood and into adulthood. Um, and I'll talk today about um, some of the experiences of, of people at the other end of this disease journey where, where the infection begins um, and some of the uh, relational and environmental conditions which may combine to put us, um, our clients or, or our patients, uh, in the perfect social and environmental situation to contract disease. In September 1994, um, on a warm and, and sunny afternoon on the outskirts of, of Brisbane, there were two horses um, who had spent the afternoon feeding under a, a big fig tree, flying foxes sleeping above them. Before, before sunset, a stable hand and a horse trainer move out into the paddock to, to bring the horses in. And they lead the two horses through the yard into the stalls at, at his stable. It's nothing out of the ordinary um, for these people. Uh, the trainer is Vic Rail. He's an experienced horseman, uh, an ex-jockey, and an, also an ex-amateur boxer. Soon after arriving, uh, though, the two horses show signs of, of lethargy and shortness of breath. They're, they're moving about restlessly in their stalls and surely um, Vic thinks they're just tired. They're just getting used to um, their new stable. The next day, other horses in the nearby stalls are breathing heavily. They're starting to act strangely, losing their balance, sweating with fever, waving their heads in distress. Veterinary treatment and advice is sought the breathing becomes more laboured and Rail sees frothing blood coming from their noses. Back at home uh, in the following days, Rail, puzzled by this illness, is lamenting the death of two of the horses. He speaks with his partner and, and, and she's noticing uh, day on day his shortness of breath and his tiredness and she urges him to see a doctor. So he does. Within a week, 14 of those 20 horses in the stable are dead and Rail has been admitted to hospital with severe pneumonia. He dies a week later, survived by his partner and two sons. Mick Rail was the first victim of an acute equine respiratory syndrome, um, a herpenovirus, which would become known as Hendra after the suburb in which it was first observed. And this is just one example of the life-changing effects of emerging zoonotic disease. As climate shifts, weather patterns change, urban sprawl increases. We're seeing new diseases like this, uh, and we're seeing established diseases emerging in new geographies and in new populations. As health professionals, we need to make ourselves aware of these dangers, aware of what is happening in the areas where we work and to be able to increase the awareness of, of uh, the presence of these diseases or the potential presence of these diseases uh, in our communities. Today, I'll talk to you about our uh, shifting climate, our growing exposure to um, uh, emerging zoonotic diseases um, through our proximity to, to animals and the environment and how we as health professionals can act in order to prevent or manage um, these diseases um, into the future as our ecology and our relationships with the outside world continue to evolve. An infectious diseases physician is often at the centre of managing these diseases you know, at an individual clinical level, but they can't do this on their own. And they're often uh, the, the final 
uh, stop in a range of steps that someone goes through before they can be diagnosed and, and adequately supported uh, through treatment. So we all need to consider our collective role in a comprehensive management of these diseases beyond the individual. So diseases like malaria, dengue fever, the SARS coronavirus, um, all of us, uh, whether we're working with animals, with humans or with both, uh, we have a role in becoming aware of the threats of emerging infectious diseases and educating our communities on the risks. Uh, and in considering these points, we'll, we'll um, have a look at the, the following questions. So we'll talk about why we're seeing new, new diseases, which ones we're seeing, what our role is, and, and finally, a little bit about what that might mean for the future. Why are we seeing new diseases? Each infectious disease depends on a niche environment uh, specific circumstances in order to reproduce, in order to find new hosts, and, and factors which can aid the spread of an infectious disease can be human, uh, they can be animal, they can be environmental. Um, but it's more useful if we look at these forms uh, in a relational capacity rather than just viewing them in isolation one by one. Uh, one health is a relatively new term. But the concept has been in existence since about the 1800s uh, when um, the fellow called Rudolf Virchow, a uh, German pathologist, began, began to promote the link between human and veterinary medicine. He was studying uh, trichinella spirosis or roundworm and he coined the term zoonosis. So a zoonosis uh, referring to a disease uh, which is spread to a human uh, through an animal vector. Uh, so from an animal to a human. Um, and in the reverse, uh, a saprinotic disease, so going from a human uh, to an animal. Carl Schwab was a veterinary epidemiologist in the mid 20th century, coined the term um, one medicine following off uh, Virchow's work and, and emphasized the, the importance of controlling and managing human and animal diseases in a common environment uh, together uh, as, as we live uh, in, a, in a coordinated fashion. And in 2007, finally, the International Ministerial Conference on Avian Pandemic Influenza recommended a, a One Health uh, approach to preparing for pandemic disease outbreaks. So as, as One Health stands in 2021, it, we recognise that to combat, combat uh, emerging infectious diseases in the context of climate shift, climate change, we have to collaborate. Uh, we have to take a collaborative approach to management of the environment and its ecosystems as well, um, and animals and human health and disease. The environment in itself is, is a shared space and, and things like animal agriculture, um, forestry, logging, urban sprawl into native habitat uh, or into agricultural space, um, shifting wild animal populations. Uh, they're all examples of potential spaces where both humans and animals can um, be exposed to new environmental conditions and, and new diseases as a result. If we look at the One Health model on screen, uh, there's a clear interrelatedness between humans, animals and, and disease or pathogens. We can see you know, just very basically there that we can be exposed to zoonotic disease through uh, things like travel, contaminated food products, hospital visits, farm visits, uh, food production and consumption. Also, I won't go into detail about it today. We can also look at this diagram um, in the context of antimicrobial resistance uh, or AMR. And AMR is often thought of as a disease created by hospitals. Um, you know, persistent exposure of bacteria to, to antibiotics, creating things like MRSA, superbugs. And, and, and while hospital superbugs form an important part of the conversation about AMR, there are other really important causes which can be tracked back to often, um, not always, but often um, poor antimicrobial steward stewardship. And that's often happening in intensive farming settings like uh, battery hen farming 
or, or close quarters, indoor pig farming, where diseases can spread quickly. Uh, producers also want to control disease quickly, and that can be done through large doses of, of antibiotics. These can contribute where uh, they're polluting local water sources uh, with antimicrobial residues like tetracyclines or um, aminoglycosides, drugs that we, we're often using to, to treat human infection as well uh, and creating a resistance in, in the local environment. Uh, and a quick reference to that, Christy Munyolo, 2018 from Molecules, uh, she's seen that um, happen very much so in, in local environments, uh, in local water sources for um, even um, quite small uh, farming operations. Uh, in early 2021, New South Wales and, and Queensland experienced flash flooding and um, claimed a whole lot of homes. Stock destroyed property across a whole lot of floodplains and the immediate threats were, were very real for people, very, very traumatic for people. And what we need to consider beyond that is, is that a flooding event also presents, uh, after the fact, the possibility of, of what we might call a, a zoonotic spillover. Stagnant water, um, warm sunny weather following that event, perfect environment in northern New South Wales uh, for mosquitoes to reproduce. And if there's disease present uh, in that mosquito population, that can easily be spread uh, to, to human beings as well. Uh, it's not hard to imagine, you know, uh, Ross River fever or, or further, further north in Queensland, things like malaria or, or chikungunya emerging um, after those flooding events. So uh, taking a more a holistic in, environmental um, look at, at um, the disease process uh, in, in our environment um, really is useful to, to mitigating these things as well. Um, and quickly jumping back to Hendra, yearly maximum temperatures uh, are on the rise. This is a look at Hendra uh, over the last decade and, and the amazing kind of spread that, that we've seen there which is um, can be quite concerning, um, but, but it's definitely something within our reach um, um, to manage from a public health perspective. One and a half degrees um, since 2000, uh, we've gone up and that's the kind of corresponding spread of, of Hendra uh, in Queensland and, and into to northern New South Wales as well. From an anthropological perspective um, and, and from a public health perspective, there's a whole lot of range of factors which we can see, which can see disease kind of transferring from the environment through an animal or, or a non-animal vector into a human. Uh, we'll start off with Zika. Many of you would have heard of Zika and um, it's, not, it's not a new virus. Um, it was first observed in the late forties um, in Uganda and in the Zika forest. And it's mainly spread through the Aedes aegypti mosquito. The thing about the Aedes, Aedes aegypti is that it is almost ubiquitous across tropical and, and subtropical climates across the world. And, and that makes the spread of the disease amongst mosquitoes and mosquito populations uh, much, much easier to do uh, than having a niche population of animals. It, it also, um, that mosquito also carries things like dengue fever and yellow fever. Uh, when it was first observed, humans uh, who, were, who were bitten and contracted Zika had quite mild symptoms. They had things like fever, joint pain, skin rash. But what happened in 2016 uh, in, in Brazil and, and across South America was that these side effects um, of pregnant women uh, giving birth um, were much more severe than, than just those immediate effects of the virus. So we saw micro, microcephaly, Guillain-Barre syndrome, that's a tongue twister. Some, some researchers think it's still not entirely proven, but there's some pretty strong evidence to say there's you know direct links in a lot of cases. A WHO report from 2016 recommends that yes, this is um, this is a side effect of it. The the fact that these symptoms and signs are often um, it could be asymptomatic, it means that it presents a really high risk to pregnant viral carriers, even if they might be aware of potential consequences of contracting Zika during pregnancy, they might not know 
even if they do contract it. And there's Im important considerations for, for that child. So in 2015 in Brazil, the, the Zika virus uh, infected around about 700,000 um, people. Because of those mild presentations, it, it remained unchecked for a long time and, and it meant that it could spread really widely before um, public health officials really cottoned on to what was happening. The continued trend uh, to urban, urbanisation in Brazil meant that there was a, um, there's a really large population. Um, they're, they're living very close with, with each other. Uh, they're in a warm and humid climate. And it was the perfect environment for an Aedes aegypti mosquito to infect people, uh, to breed and to continue that cycle. Jing Wen um, from 2016, um, they, they've also criticised the management of, of the Aedes aegypti in Brazil um, and, and called it a perfect storm, basically. That environment, um, the human factors uh, and, and the animal factors that were allowed to, to kind of coalesce and, and bring on this um, horrible epidemic. If the symptoms of Zika are so mild, um, what was everyone so worried about? It was that they, they weren't particularly worried. Um, there'd been very few cases of, of post-viral syndromes or congenital effects on infants who were in utero um, during, during maternal infection before 2007. Uh, again, that's CDC data. Uh, but for reasons that remain unclear, in the months following the initial epidemic in Brazil, and, and more broadly, again, in, in across South America and, and it's kind of spread north into, into Panama and even further north, um, uh, approaching Mexico. The, this worrying trend began to emerge where the incidence of microcephaly and Guillain-Barre syndrome shot through the roof. Between October 2015 and April 2016, there were nearly 7,000 children born with a central nervous system disorder. In, uh, in Brazil, uh, a little bit over a thousand of those with proven links to Zika. So to manage this, um, manage this outbreak from a, a, a public health point of view, um, the, the WHO took um, six steps basically. And the first one was, was to coordinate the response. This involved uh, engaging social scientists. So people like me who don't know anything about clinical medicine, um, to be able to engage with the community, study how the disease was impacting communities and from a social point of view, how is that affecting your work? You know, who are you with when you, when you got infected? Um, you know, who do you socialize with? What's your living situation? All of those kinds of things. In a city like Sao Paulo in, in Brazil, being able to communicate the dangers of an epidemic to each and every person uh, is no mean feat uh, because it involves communicating across demographics, across languages, across different uh, socioeconomic groups. How can we communicate to uh, a rich private businessman living in his uh, palated, uh, palatial gated um, mansion and at the same time, send that, that same message to uh, a young family living in squalor and, uh, you know, and they can't read or write and, and they, they've lived in the favelas all their life. Um, secondly, there's, there's surveillance, epidemiological data on, on incidence and prevalence of the disease. Third step, caring for the sick uh, or at risk. And the WHO really needed to, to look at the big picture here um for for prevention and infection because women needed to be protected from unwanted pregnancy um, experts needed to be available to treat and manage um, central nervous system disorders uh, and they needed to to be able to to manage service delivery uh, based on need and priority so there's a whole lot of different professionals a whole lot of different areas of expertise that are needed in there. At the centre, your, your infectious diseases physician, your, neuro your neurologist, paediatric neurologist, you've got your obstetrician, gynaecologist, you've got your service delivery people, you've got public health people, uh, you've got everyone in the teams around those people. Fourth, vector control. So how do we control these mosquitoes? 
Um, how can we use insect, insecticides safely in, in a densely populated area? You know, those, those are the questions that the WHO have to ask themselves. How could they get PPE or, you know, how could they get um, condoms to people to protect them from sexually transmitted Zika? Fifth, risk communication and community engagement. So communities needed to, to know the real risk of Zika, potential consequences consequences for their children. So beyond just that mild kind of fever and pain that they might get um, for a little while. Finally, research. So uh, this is kind of more to um, inform future responses, I suppose. Uh, how can it be mitigated in the future and what, what can you learn from this? So, so it, it's a very complex picture of, of the public health response to a disease uh, which on the face of it and due to its history, it wasn't necessarily seen as significant in the first instance. The most effective way we can help to educate people here is, you know, whether it's Zika, whether it's another mosquito-borne illness, you know, perhaps something that's more common in Australasia, even though we have um, had some instances of Zika in PNG. Um, but it's, it's to wear long sleeves and trousers, uh, to cover up, to use bed nets, uh, to use insect repellent. Um, those are fairly accessible things to be able to do, really going to help and, and did help a lot of these people in, in Brazil and across South America. Uh, another example of how an outbreak can potentially happen, we'll talk about toxoplasmosis. So toxo is, um, it's caused by toxoplasmosis gondii. And so we're moving from viruses to a, a protozoan here. And it's seen some changes in its epidemiology in the 2000s. Pinto Ferreira, uh, 2019, saw that the, the typical transmissions through the, the oocyte of, of toxo in raw or undercooked meat, um, often, often pork um, was, was more common, or meat products, you know, so um, uh, any kind of processed meats or, or, um, or animal products. They're, they're not necessarily the only sources of infection and not necessarily the most common sources of infection now and the transmission source is, a, is varying according to the environment. So modern toxo infections appear to be emerging more often in contaminated water, uh, through water supply, uh, or through irrigation, um, and that can in turn also contaminate fruit and vegetables. So there's fruit and vegetables um, that are linked to infections as well. But in order to understand the progression of, of how uh, to continue to combat these infections, we need to understand its history so that we can figure out, you know, why is this changing or why is it different in different environments? Uh, in Australia, it, it, toxo is quite rare, uh, but at the same time, about 80% of us aren't immune to it, um, according to, to Pappas in uh, 2009. And just like Zika, um, pregnant women are at high risk of, of infection of, of, or infection of their children if uh, in utero. But um, at the same time, unlike Zika, the, the infection can become chronic. Um, and in areas where there's uh, a lack of unfiltered water, prevalence can, can sometimes reach, uh, so outside of Australia, this is prevalence can sometimes reach upwards of 70%. Um, and it can lie at uh, its bradyzoidic stage um, or, or dormant stage in, uh, in a host, including humans, um, for years um, on end. So what it does in that stage is that it creates a, a cyst so, uh, that is um, not vulnerable to a lot of the typical medical therapies that are, that are used to combat it once it has become dormant, uh, can become a, you know, a chronic infection. So what kind of environments do we need to be aware of when we're considering toxo? Uh, in underdeveloped areas or, or in agricultural areas, um, it's, transmit it's transmitted um, through animal feces most often or, or con contaminated water. But in more developed or urban areas, um, uh, often this is more common in Australia and in cities, the biggest danger is cats, sand pits, litter trays, areas where cats groom themselves and, and spend time. Um, so sand pits and litter trays, thing, that's where they're, they're leaving their feces and they're covering it up. 
miscarriage and, and congenital defects are, are common symptoms uh, in, in pregnant women and their babies. It can often lead to neurodevelopmental disorder. One of the interesting, uh, one of the interesting facts about um, Toxo is uh, some of the quite strange symptoms uh, in people with chronic Toxo infections. There's some pretty decent evidence to show that it can lead to a diagnosis of schizophrenia behavior change, even car accidents. So people making strange decisions that are leading them into to car accidents have been linked pretty closely with um, chronic toxo infection and, and suicide attempts, attempts as well. Latent infections are probably more dangerous because we're, we're not treating them at all. It's the ones often that are becoming chronic uh, and being linked to these kind of these mental illnesses all these um, behavior changes that we're seeing and possibly uh, you know from a pathophysiological point of view be linked to um, the bradyzoite lodging itself in the host's brain where it often ends up what does this mean for for the management of, of toxo in our communities the most important steps that that we need to take are, are washing vegetables ensuring access to clean water ensuring good hygiene around furry friends and if your partner is pregnant or if you are pregnant, then someone else will be on litter tray duty, duty for your cat for at least nine months. Uh, if you are pregnant, you should not go near uh, a litter tray. Uh, and what is our role as health professionals? So this is a more detailed a, a model of One Health um, system. Because of, of climate shift, um, population growth in Australia, population distribution, human geography, uh, we need to continue how to, to monitor how we live with animals and, and how we live with the ecosystems around us. And we need to know how they're changing. Um, it's, it's a great argument for a focus on One Health rather than just individual diseases uh, and taking action to, to educate communities about the risks around them. And health professionals, uh, we need to make ourselves aware of how our living habits can affect disease acquisition and spread. These are the three points that I've put together, um, which tend to be quite effective. Um, firstly, we need to identify local risk. So questions to ask ourselves here are things like, where, where are people living? Is there clean running water? Do they live with pets? Are they co-sleeping with pets? You know, a lot of people sleep with their dog or cat. Are we living near production animals? Are we living and working in an agricultural area? Who are the people they connect with? Where do they go uh, during the course of the week? Uh, also, what are the cultural factors? Um, do we have particular cultural beliefs or healing practices that might put us at risk? Um, I know in, in Italian and, and Greek communities in Sydney, uh, recently the ABC and, and, and GPs have been reporting uh, older, older community members have been very reluctant to, to be vaccinated against um, COVID-19 because they have a, a cultural belief around um, uh, vaccination that might make them sick. But, but that family kind of unit uh, influencing people's um, decisions. In, and we also need to consider what kind of protective behaviours people are already using. You know, are they having safe sex? Are they, um, you know, are they wearing insect repellent? You know, all those kinds of things. And importantly, we need to know which, which diseases we're looking for. So are we in a tropical climate? Are we looking for things like malaria, um, Zika? Are we in rural areas? Are we worrying more about things like Q fever and brucellosis? Are we in a large, uh, are we in a community with a large population of flying foxes? Uh, I won't talk about diagnosis or, or that kind of thing here because I'm not a medical doctor or a paramedic. Um, but once you have an idea of those local disease risks, um, you can pursue further clinical education and on diagnosis. Secondly, we need to educate. A lot of people um, talk about conspiracy theories. Some people don't wash hands after going to the toilet. Um, simple things like this that, that can be attributed to, to bad health outcomes. You know, is there internal service awareness? Uh, are other local communities surveilling these potential risks? Um, communicating these to, to, to people um, in um, leadership roles in the community uh, you know is there an interagency meeting is there an elders group is there a recognition broadly of one health in that community as ourselves ourselves as um, 
community members are we aware of the risks as health professionals and, and leading leading the communication of that uh, and and then finally um, mitigation strategies so when we do promote mitigation strategies we need to be aware that although one strategy for example um, uh, wearing long pants long sleeves that could mitigate mitigate against several vector borne diseases uh, it may not be practical for some people, may not be widely adopted in, in some contexts. Courtsmith um, in, in 2020 looked at, at prenatal counselling about Zika. He found that it didn't work effectively because people got uncomfortable, uh, it was too hot, uh, and they took these protective clothing, clothing items off, which put them at greater risk. Um, but there were, there were other strategies that they could use, um, such as being inside with, um, with screens on, on doors and windows, which would reduce their risk of contracting the disease. But uh, also, um, we need to make sure that these resources are available in certain instances, because we don't know if that person can afford those clothes. We don't know if they can afford insect repellent. We don't know if they can afford screens or bed nets. What does this, what does this mean going ahead? Since Vic Rail's death and the death of those 14 horses in, in 1994, Hendra's emerged several times, as I, I showed you in that graphic before, um, in spillover events in New South Wales and in Queensland. And, and on a regular basis, it, it's continuing to threaten the safety of, of horses uh, and people who are working with them. Um, a vaccine since been developed for um, for horses, but at the moment uh, we as humans are, are relying on that vac vaccine to to protect us. We remain relatively unprotected, um, with a, a mortality rate of around sixty percent. That's that's quite a, an ongoing concern. Though Hendra is, is is really quite well known, and especially in those little niches uh, and, and circles where where spillovers have, spillovers have occurred in the past, you know, in vet circles, in in um, you know, people working with horses, um, and knowledge of its 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 consequences. So the mitigation strategies um, that they use are common. So being being sure to vaccinate, being being sure to wash your hands, um, the the two biggest strategies to to mitigate the spread. But where there are unknown diseases that emerge in the boundaries between uh, ecosystems and human and animal domains uh, and communities aren't prepared, um, we're at much greater risk of, of developing more frequent epidemic and, and pandemic events now and into the future uh, if we don't act um, through the One Health lens. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, for that really interesting presentation. Our next speaker uh, is Mark Rigger. Mark is an occupational hygienist and senior application engineer. His role focuses on providing technical end user guidance and ad advice around the selection, use and maintenance of personal protective equipment. Mark has a master's in science, occupational hygiene practice and 18 years experience in safety equipment and training. Mark also hosts the very well-known Science of Safety podcast, which is available on all major podcast platforms. It's where he chats with expert guests on a range of WHS topics to provide practical advice and guidance for the workplace. He's currently the chair of the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists and Respiratory Fit Testing Training and Accreditation Program. So let's welcome Mark and we look forward to your presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Reggers and I'll be presenting this particular webinar on respirator fit testing, why and how. I am a occupational hygienist and senior application engineer uh, working for the 3M Australia New Zealand uh, business, part of the personal safety division. Um, I've been working, I guess, in the PPE safety equipment space for nearly 20 uh, years now. So hopefully we can cover um, a bit of information around respirator fit testing. Um, and what we're trying to cover off um, today is its place or respirator fit testing place within a respiratory protection program. I'm going to give a bit of a high level overview of different methodologies and considerations for workplaces looking to implement fit testing and other things that hopefully will help you as you go forward um, implementing respirator fit testing, be it you're doing it yourself or you're engaging a third party to do that on your behalf. So let's get into it. 
So I guess I just wanted to start off looking at, there's a whole range of different types of respirators that you're probably familiar with in your day-to-day travels from a COVID pandemic impact, or maybe just from an industrial or on the job or at home use, I should say. So we sort of can break these respirators down to a couple of high level categories. The first one here is what we classify as air purifying respirators. So what we mean by that is that these respirators all have uh, filters that capture the contaminant um, and then you will be breathing in the clean or purified air as the wearer. So all these work on the same concept. Now, obviously these reusable ones here will have different filters for different types of contaminants, but still work on the same principle of capturing the contaminants out of the air. We refer to it as negative pressure because inside the respirator, when the wearer is breathing, is creating a negative pressure, putting inward pressure on the seals of our respirator um, around your face um, inside of that versus a powered air purifying respirator, also known as a PAPR or P-A-P-R. So it still works on the same concept of using a filter to capture the contaminants out of the air, but there's a, a fan and a blower and the battery pack in these particular units. These come in different shapes and sizes depending on the brand and manufacturer, but that actually fan is pulling the air through the fan for you rather than you using uh, the lungs yourself and blowing that air up into your head top. So it's positive pressure because there is that positive amount of air or that flow coming into the head top or face piece, which is pushing outward on the seal. I've got a slide uh, next after this, which sort of visually shows what I'm trying to uh, communicate there. And then we have what we call supplied air respirators. So that's for environments where um, we're supplying the air to the wearer from an external source. So these pictures here, these will connect to a airline, which then go through an air panel, generally connected into a compressor. So we're not cleaning the air per se, um, but something like this is a negative and positive pressure respirator there. And then we have our self-contained breathing apparatus, probably familiar with the firefighters running into a burning building. Um, they don't know what the contaminants are, but they're bringing the air with them. So there's a whole range of different types of respirators there, but some out of every category require fit testing, which what we would call as tight fitting respirators. So hopefully we'll, we'll cover <clears throat> broadly what these types are and maybe whether that applies to you on the job. Most commonly in industry, it's going to be those in this air purifying respirator space. So quickly, here's a picture just showing that visual concept of positive pressure respirators where the air is getting blown, pushed up through the tube into whatever the head top is, and then pushing out of the seals, preventing contaminants from getting inside the uh, face piece there. And there's a couple of examples of a couple of different head tops and blower units. Now, the Australian standard categorizes the different types of respirators by their protection factor. So very simply, what the protection factor is looking is what is the amount of reduction that respirator is providing to you, the wearer, or your workers? And this is calculated by dividing the concentration outside the respirator by the concentration getting inside the respirator. Now, how it's getting in there isn't really of importance because this could be coming through the filter, through valves, gaps between the face and the respirator. It's not important in the fact if it's getting in, it's getting in, it's going to be breathed in. So if we had a respirator and the concentration outside was quite high and the concentration inside the respirator was exactly the same, well, the question would be asked, what is the respirator actually doing for you? Not much in that circumstance. So we want a respirator that's going to reduce the exposure from outside to considerably lower on the inside. So here's some very simple numbers here from a, just trying to illustrate the point here. So if we had 20 furry particles floating outside the respirator and two are getting inside the respirator in this example here. So 20 divided by two gives us 10. So a protection factor of 10. We've got a 10 times reduction in exposure from outside the respirator to inside the respirator. So the Australian standard categorizes these different combinations of respirators um, referred to as required minimum protection factor. So this is just a, a poster that we, we freely provide. Just trying to visually show that the different combinations of products have different protection factors or assigned protection factors that are used in the selection of the respirator. Now, one of the things I probably would just want to highlight here is a common thing that is not just the filtration level that determines the the protection level. I guess in, in my travels quite often, oh, it's got a P3, which is the highest particulate filter rating under the Australian standards. So it's got to have to be high, but you can see it depends on what is it attached to? Is it positive or negative pressure? We can see here we've got a half face with a P3, which is RMPF of 10. Here we have a PAPR with a loose fitting head top of a P3, that's up to 50. Then we've got a P3 with a negative pressure full face, which is up to 100. And then a positive pressure 
PAPR with a P3 is 100 plus. So the filter um, is part of that equation that goes into determining what that protection factor may be, but what is it actually attached to is a key consideration in question um, when selecting a respirator. Now we're gonna be talking about fit testing, but I just really wanna highlight that fit testing is one component of a respirator protection program or res respiratory protection program. Um, the Australian standard 1715 will be your go-to location as, a, as, as the starting point to get an appreciation or understanding of what are all those different elements that, that are part of a respiratory protection program and RPP quite often commonly referred to. So we talk about the selection and issue, they're only one part. So what we're trying to get away from is, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Worker, here is your respirator, here's your PPE, off you go, figure it out for yourself. That is not what we wanna have here. So this is talking about the selection, is part of a program. And fit is a critical component of that respiratory protection program. We can select the right respirator, do the screening, people be trained up how to use it. We give them, we issue the resp respiratory protective equipment, RPE, but if it doesn't fit the person or can't fit or not fitted correctly, well, it doesn't really matter that you've selected the right filter because so much relies on behavior when we're talking about PPE, not just respirators, but any type of PPE, hence why it's that lowest control order that we wanna try and uh, not uh, use if we can control it with a higher control uh, process there. So just wanna highlight the fact that fit testing that we're gonna talk about is one key and critical important component, but not the only component of a program that should be in place in a workplace where respirators are being issued to workers. Now, when we talk about tight fitting respirator performance, uh, there's probably three key areas that I just really wanna to highlight to you and get you thinking about, are these three things in place when I think about my workers or yourself when you're wearing a respirator? So number one, compliance, wear time. It needs to be worn. Now, I know that sounds really obvious, but I would probably have the situations where maybe a piece of PPE, a respirator is left in the van. Uh, that could be an ambulance, could be a work use. Um, it could be left out on a workbench. And this is a number of years ago, I was doing some asbestos monitoring in a particular workplace and they had the requirement to wear disposable respirators. And this particular worker was on this sorting line and he had one respirator on his forehead and one actually on his neck, but nothing on his mouth. And so like I say this with a, a bit cheekily, but like he was so close, you know, it was on his head, but not actually where it needs to be. So it needs to be worn. Number two, it needs to be the right filter for the airborne hazard in question that we're trying to protect the worker from. There's no good selecting a particulate filter if the hazard is a gas or vapor, as an example, it's gonna go straight through. So it needs to be the right filter for what we're working with. And then the third part is fit. Now this is the biggest variable from a, you know, a manufacturer point of view, we can test the filters, we can test the products and a whole bunch of different things, but when it comes to fitting an individual person, we, we can't test that because we're all different and we'll talk about that a bit later on. So we need these three things in place to have confidence that protection is gonna be achieved and it's gonna be consistently achieved. So I wanna show you this quick picture here. You may have seen it before, but if we look at this, I wanna ask the question, what kind of protection is this individual achieving? You know, thinking about our three elements that we spoke about. Number one, is he wearing it? Tick, yes, all right, we're one third of the way there. Is it the right filter type? Yes, tick, all right, we're two thirds of the way there. We must be able to achieve protection. But clearly I've obviously got a very obvious photo and hopefully you've, uh, you've picked up that I don't think you could more incorrectly fit a respirator if you tried to more incorrectly fit a respirator here. Um, this, this gentleman here has got the respirator on sideways, obviously going around the ear straps there. This particular model, it goes over the head and around the neck. Here we have the nose bridge that's there as well. That goes over the nose. The gentleman has facial hair, which we'll talk about, which is a big no-no with tight fitting respirators. And clearly we can see the gap um, here between the wearer. And it's not that I'm trying to have a go at this particular individual, but clearly he's been given a piece of PPE that hasn't been given the instruction or the guidance on what to do. Now, fitting a respirator is not hard to fit a respirator, but it's but it breaks my heart as a health and safety professional seeing on social media where you have uh, people that have, you know, doing a task, might be doing something at home, they've acknowledged there's a, there's a risk there and a hazard there, they've gone and purchased some PPE equipment, they've gone to put it on, but it's on upside down or sideways or something along those lines. It all comes crashing down very, very quickly if that fit or seal is not gonna be there, which is critical when we're thinking about achieving protection with a tight fitting respirator. 
So when we look at Australian standards 1715, the question maybe you're asking yourself, does 1715 testing identify good fit? Well, I would say it fulfills very basic health and safety requirements. So part of the requirements on the standard, which is 1716 as well, which is the manufacturer's standard, um, they have to do what they call a total inward leakage test on 10 subjects. That's only 10. Now, you think about maybe your workforce or just the general workforce that's out there. We have a very diverse multicultural uh, country, which is fantastic, but obviously we all have different facial shapes, sizes, characteristics with different nationalities or eth ethnic backgrounds. That has a huge impact on the fit. So even under the Australian standard, if they were you know, doing total till testing, as we call total inward leakage, fit testing 50, 100, 1,000 people, that's never gonna represent every person that's going to be on the job. And that's where fit testing is such a critical component. Now, there's many factors that impact fit. I quickly want to go through. When I talk about fit, it's not just the fact of, you know, how they've fitted it, but there's other things which can impact the fit and that seal being achieved. So we look at facial hair is probably the biggest challenge when it comes to the, the, the male population, where we'll look at some pictures next just showing the size of the contaminants that typically we think about aerosols and droplets in the occupational hygiene world. We talk about respirable dust or inhalable dust. They're many times smaller than one facial hair, which we'll have a look at in the next slide. But there's other things like major dental work that'll affect the person's facial shape. Teeth are missing, teeth have been removed. That could impact the face and how that respirator fits. The training, understanding the fitting skills. I use that example of you know people on social media posting it on sideways. Fitting a respirator is not hard, but you don't know what you don't know. So people need to be given that instruction to know what to do and how to do it consistently. Um, the Australian standard talks about makeup. Now, not that I've come across workplaces in, in my own personal travels where makeup is particularly an issue, but what the standard is trying to communicate here is that anything that's going to be on the wearer's face that can increase the likelihood of the respirator slipping or moving around, that's going to increase the likelihood of, of a seal breakage or um, an exposure or something happening there, which is what we're trying to avoid. You know, this is showing some pictures of some of the 3M products that are here. You think about all the brands and styles that are available on the marketplace. There's, you know, they're all similar where they go, but they're not exactly the same. Um, so that has an impact on how it fits you, an individual, your workers. And the other one that comes up all the time is other PPE. Now, it's not the fact you can't wear all these different types of PPE together. As an example, hard hats and respirators and safety glasses. But certainly if you're expecting a wearer to wear this combination for you know significant periods of time, it's going to get uncomfortable. They're going to want to take it off. They're going to want to move it. The most common one is when, gee, this respirator is pretty poor. It's leaking and fogging up my safety glasses. There's your first indicator of, hey, if stuff's able to get out, that means stuff's able to get in as well. So there's a little, little, little thing there if you've got your workers um, saying that kind of stuff need to look at that combination of PPE. I've got highlighted here what we've seen in the pandemic, uh, more so on the healthcare side of things, obviously some of those, you know, pressure industries from wearing respirators for long periods of time. What you typically sometimes see is people wearing all these bandages or pads that take the pressure off the nose bridge. But when we're talking about a tight fitting respirator, that's a big no-no. That's actually lifting the respirator off your face and creating a seal, or sorry, an opening in that seal for stuff to get in. If that's a surgical mask, not as much as an issue because that is not designed to be a tight fitting piece of PPE in that regard. But from a respirator, yes, that is a huge concern there if people are doing that. Now here's this picture I was alluding to earlier around tight fitting respirators and facial hair. This here is one picture of one of my facial hairs from a little, little project I did a couple of years ago, but just showing the size of different particulates or aerosols next to one of my facial hairs. Now you think about in the COVID world and droplet, you know, whether, you know, five micron, 10 micron, one micron, you think about the presence of facial hair, it's going to more easily bypass that. Now here's a couple of studies um, I usually refer to. And these were done in the 1980s. So this is not new studies or any you know anything that should be uh, blowing people's minds but just highlighting the fact that in the presence of facial hair it's going to significantly reduce the expected level of protection of that tight fitting respirator here's a couple of studies you know increasing from 20 times to a thousand times in the presence of facial hair at least a 330 fold drop in protection was experienced by bearded wearers so you know there is that variability that we're wearing respirators to protect ourselves 
and we know the presence can significantly reduce that. And it's a challenge. Certainly we have, you know, workers for religious reasons and personal reasons. So maybe other types of PPE that are tight fitting respirators. When we think about some of these loose fitting head tops, that may be a case there. Now here's a little table that we'd like to show just to give people an indicator. Well, now when we talk about facial hair and respirators, it's in that sealing surface area. So as an example here, Mr. Clean Shaven, which is fantastic. Um, excuse me here. Um, here we have Clean Shaven. We're gonna get green ticks of all the styles. Um, here this gentleman here with a mustache is not gonna be great for a half face or disposable. That's gonna be in the sealing surface area. But with a full face, that's gonna be within that sealing surface area outside um, of that inside area there. So that would be a green tick. Now, when we start talking about these PAPRs with different types of head tops, the reason we have question mark here is that the beard can't be flowing out of the respirator. That positive pressure needs to be maintained in the head top. So if we've got facial hair flowing out of the seal, that's allow a higher volume of air to escape. And the question then is, well, is that maintaining enough of a bubble or enough of a positive pressure? to prevent contaminants from entering. So that's why it's a question mark. It's gonna be on a, an individual assessment, but certainly if you've got workers that are starting to grow their beard for uh, Santa season, um, you can't have that flowing out of the respirator um, there. So it's not certain types of facial hair may not be suitable for any types of respirators. So we look at these range of different respirators. There's a whole type here, but any one of these, what we talk about a tight fitting respirator, whether it's negative or positive pressure, requires a respirator fit test according to the standards and typically what the regulators are expecting across the country. Um, here, you know, from disposable to half face to full face to SCBA, all have that same requirement. Now it's a common question to say, well, why does the positive pressure uh, tight fitting respirators require fit testing where loose fitting tight fitting respirators don't require a fit test. Now, if you think back to the slide I showed earlier, where we show those different levels of respiratory protection being achieved, a SCBA or PAPR with a positive pressure has a higher assigned protection factor than a loose fitting head top. Now that higher assigned protection factor is based on the positive pressure as well as that seal being maintained and free from facial hair and that fit being achieved. So it may be something in your environment, depends on where you are, what you're doing, that you may need to look at something of these different combinations where appropriate for facial hair um, as well. Something to consider, of course, depending on your environment. And then we get into, well, what is a fit test? I hope that I've highlighted how critical that fit is to achieving protection, maintaining protection on a range of tight fitting respirators. So a respirator fit test can be designed as a method for checking that a tight fitting face piece matches a person's facial features, characteristics, and that seal is able to be achieved. Now there's a few different methods that we're gonna to touch on uh, to determine that, but quite simply, the purpose of a fit test is to determine that a respirator fit face piece can adequately fit and create a seal on a wearer. Now for an individual that may not pass a fit test, it's, it's not a reflection on the respirator. It's not a reflection on the individual person per se, but it's that compatibility between the two that isn't able to achieve the fit. Now, as a workplace, as a health and safety professional, um, as an individual, well, you kind of want to know that before you actually are going into that contaminated environment. Hence why this should be done um, before a respirator is issued to be used in the workplace um, as well. Um, if someone doesn't pass a, a fit test, what that means is they need to do other, another fit test or another style to determine one that fits them. Now, the reason I say that, this is a couple of years ago, I had a particular regulator ring me up to confirm this and they were definitely on the right path where they come across a workplace where they conducted fit testing. Excellent, that's fantastic, but they hadn't passed, but then they hadn't gone and conducted any other fit testing after the fact as well. So then they were allowing their workers to continue wearing a respirator that it was proven that they couldn't achieve an adequate seal. That is what we want to avoid. So if you don't pass one, that's not the end of the world. It just means we need to try another face piece or style till we find one that is suitable for that individual. Now, what I just want to highlight here is the fact that fit testing is not a new concept. Um, this is a little video from the 1930s here. Um, I'll just make, 
I'll just uh, turn the, 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 the music there. Um, so this is from the 1930s. So this is just trying to highlight the fact that back then they knew that fit was an important critical aspect to achieving protection as well. Now, fortunately, the fit testing methods that we do use today has um, improved and doesn't create such as a risk, as you're seeing on the screen there right now, is that they're blowing a whole bunch of coal dust into the wearer's face. And this is a bit of a, a visual qualitative type fit test. So the fit tester is going to remove that respirator and going to see and look for the visual clean lines. Now, certainly when you think about respirable coal dust, um, that wouldn't be the only thing we'd be looking at. But like I said, just trying to highlight the point that fit testing is not a new concept. This is from the 1930s. We're in 90 years since that point in time. Yet many workplaces and environments are only first coming across fit testing right now. It's been part of the Australian standards for decades. Um, so hopefully this puts in place that this is something you should be thinking about if it has, you've only recently come across it as well. So why fit tests? And I hope that I've alluded to these, these facts already, but we are all different. Every face is different in the workplace. Um, one respirator style or size or brand is not going to fit every face the same. You know, it's, it's, it's been proven many times that fit um, equals respiratory protection because it all comes crashing down, especially on those tight fitting face pieces where that fit and seal is not being, uh, being uh, achieved there. So when do we need to fit test? Well, when there's an initial selection of any respiratory protective equipment, RPE, maybe you're introducing a new face piece or style that wasn't previously tested, or you're changing the model and brand. You could have individuals that um, have had, you know, significant weight gain or weight loss. I mean, anything that is going to impact a person's facial shape, um, and which is why the Australian standards recommend and the ISO standards and OSHA and pretty much all of the international fit, fit testing standards and respiratory standards that it gets uh, conducted annually. And certainly there's different studies out there happy to share that sort of supports why that is the recommendation with all these um, bodies. So as I alluded to other times, we may need to repeat a fit test where there's a significant weight gain or loss substantial dental work that's changed, you know, I guess the, the, the face shape, maybe they're a bit more gaunt because they've had some teeth re removed. Uh, maybe they've broken their nose. Maybe there's a scar, facial piercing. Maybe you're introducing safety glasses or goggles. So there's a couple of things that may trigger another fit test to be uh, conducted again. Now there's a few different types of fit testing methods. These are probably the most common ones you're more likely to come across in Australia. The first one is a qualitative method uh, referred to as an aerosol taste test. Uh, then we have our quantitative methods. So ambient aerosol condensation nuclei counting, CNC. You may be familiar with the Porter count machine or the AccuFit machine. And then we also have a control negative pressure, which is a bit lesser known in Australia, but certainly it is out there and it has its uh, applications within industry as well. And we'll touch on some of the, I guess, the benefits and limitations of each of those methods. So for each of the methods, there's different fit testing exercises that are performed during a fit test. Now, this is just an example of one protocol with one timing. There are other ones with less exercises and different timings. But as an example, typically there's going to be a series of exercises to try and replicate um, movement as in a you know as a substitute for on the job certainly does not equate to the movement on the job but um, you're going to be seeing people normal breathing deep breathing turning their head bending up and down talking out loud um, but as i said this is sort of one one protocol very differences but in principle you know different exercises and, and timings a person's going to undertake during a fit test now for each of these specific methods there are limitations and benefits, as I, as I mentioned. The Australian standards talk about each of these um, to be aware of. It doesn't say one method is better than another per se, but it really is around being aware of what those limitations and benefits are. So for the fit testing method that is being selected, um, it is appropriate for the product style requirements that you're wearing here. So a couple of really great things around the aerosol taste test. It's you know a fairly low cost compared to buying these other machines here. There's no power required. There's no adapters required. Uh, can test the face piece plus filters. But some of the limitations and the things to be aware of. 
you're relying, it's a subjective test, relying on the integrity and the, and the trustworthiness of the person to tell us whether they can or can't taste something. Now, there's going to be individual variations of what they can and can't taste. You know, there's a claustrophobia feel. Um, it can't fit test full face respirators. So maybe you're a workplace with full face respirators, then this method would not be something that would be suitable for that. Um, it takes the longest out of the fit test when we think about wash, washing your mouth out, allowing time. Um, and then once you, if you, if a fit test doesn't pass, you need to go through the whole uh, taste threshold screening process again. Um, often people will see there's not high tech and there's no electronic database. So as a, as a workplace, you're going to be either manually writing that down or maybe recording it in a computer program or an Excel spreadsheet. Here we have um, the CNC method. So pictured of, of a port account here. Now it can, it can fit test a full range of face pieces and filters. The next slide will look at that sort of shows and compares these different methods to what may or may not be suitable. It um, has electronic uh, record taking, but you do require fit test adapters to the, to the reusable respirator style. You need specific N95 technology when fit testing a P2 or a P1 as an example, it requires a specific ambient particle concentration. Um, like I said, things to be aware of. It, it doesn't mean it's, it's bad per se, but obviously not understanding or knowing this information certainly can have an impact on the outcome results if people aren't competent who are fit testing. Controlled negative pressure may not be something you've heard of before, but very simply um, what it does, it actually sucks the air of your reusable respirator to, to be a negative pressure. And then it measures if that negative pressure is being maintained. If it sucks it out and then the pressure drops back because of the leak, well, clearly that's not a good fit. Um, so like I said, less common in Australia, but certainly you may come across it a bit more. Um, with this method, you cannot fit test filtering face pieces or disposable respirators you may commonly refer to. So once again, if you've got the requirement for disposables or filtering face pieces, that's not going to be a method that's going to be suitable. Where your CNC method is going to be suitable for a wide range of face pieces as well. So like I said, positives and negatives or limitations you need to be aware of. Standards don't say one's better than the other, but it's something to keep in the back of the mind when you're going down this path where what may be suitable. So the next sort of question that gets asked is, well, who can conduct this fit testing? Now, I guess, I'm not a guess, but in the Australian standard, it doesn't specify what a competent person is or a competent person needs to demonstrate. It talks about the methods. So it sort of falls under this general, you know, to perform any task in the workplace under that duty of care, they need to be competent to do those things. We, I guess in Australia, most commonly refer to the um, international standard, ISO standard 16973, which actually breaks down what that competent person should be able to demonstrate. And it's more than just knowing how to use a machine. I mean, <laughs> It's, you know, yes, you can use a port account as an example, but having an understanding of what you're looking for, passing on information is such a critical component of a fit test. Now, whoever's doing your fit testing, now that could be an internal person, it could be an external service provider, and that's a decision for each workplace or environment to assess and make a determination on. Whoever it is, you want them to be competent because the outcome or the reliability of that outcome really does hinge on that person's ability to follow the protocol and understand what they're doing in the impact of uh, the fit test that they may be having by their actions or the lack of actions in that regard. Something that you may have heard of um, in, in recent time is a program called RESPFIT, which is a respirator fit testing training and accreditation program. This is a program that has been developed and managed by the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists. Um, and I'm, I'm involved in this particular program, but the objective of this program, which sort of got started uh, nearly two and a half years ago now, is to improve the competency of fit testers in Australia. What we were seeing in industry and I know I can you know from my own personal travels with my role at 3M you know you you come to some workplaces where they've got some really great standards they've you know uh, sought out training information and build experience um, but then on the other end of the spectrum you visit workplaces that have watched the YouTube video bought a kit uh, doing half the procedures and going hey that's that's a fit test and it's not for lack of effort they've gone and purchased a fit test kit in that example, but they've certainly fallen short with what the requirements are to have a reliable fit test outcome. So if you haven't come across RESPFIT in your travels before, 
um, and you're getting involved in the respirator fit testing side of things, I certainly would recommend that you do go visit restfit.org.au. There's a lot of information around uh, fit testing in general. Uh, there is a whole bunch of resources, studies, papers, references internationally around fit testing and respirator protection programs. So I hope um, you find that useful in your travels as well. There's a whole, bit, whole lot more about RestFit, but go check out the website. I'm sure that will um, be a fantastic starting point. So you've decided, all right, we wanna do fit testing in our workplace. But look, I'd, I'd probably say the actual fit testing part is probably the, the easiest and simplest part of the process. And what I mean by that is all the logistics around the respirator fit testing is the challenge. How does that work within your, in your workplace? So a couple of things to have a think about, you know, as you're going down this pathway or you're, you're already down that pathway, who out of your workers needs fit testing? Do you need to prioritize based on risk? Is it every worker? Is it half the workforce? Is it a certain um, shift? Whatever it may be. So who requires fit testing in that regard? What products? Now, there's a whole range of different respiratory brands and styles out there. Now, doing fit testing, I know it's to say as a manufacturer working for 3M, 3M doesn't say that one style or size will fit every single worker. So let's say you've selected a disposable cup respirator that you're seeing on the screen there. Now, you're expecting some people are not going to pass that. Just, just out of the statistics of things, someone's not going to pass that with the variability. So what is your second product, your third product? You know, if you're conducting fit testing, you don't want to say to the individual, whether it's internal or external, hey, you haven't passed this fit test. But now you've got to send them away. They have to come back off the job again at another time. So what products are requiring fit testing? What's your plan B and your plan C? What fit testing method? Aerosol taste test, uh, CNC, uh, CNP need to determine what method you want to uh, go through. Who will be conducting that testing? Do you want to have the capability internally to do the fit testing? Do you want to outsource that to particular uh, companies that provide that as a service? Now, there's obviously different costs and implications on different pathways you go down, but that needs to be considered um, um, as well as you go down this pathway. Where are you going to conduct the fit testing? Um, the different methodologies have different considerations when we look at the ideal size of rooms and facilities. Um, the CNC method relies on a ambient aerosol concentration. So if you're fit testing a really large room or maybe a warehouse or outside as an example, your, your ambient particle or aerosol levels are probably going to go up and down because of the ventilation in that particular space. We want to try and get a consistent, reliable range of aerosols. So typically for a CNC method, a smaller room is going to be ideal to maintain a certain level of aerosols for that reliability of the fit test outcome or the fit factors you're looking to achieve there. The scheduling and briefing, fit testing takes time that we'll touch on as well. Where are they going to do it? How are you scheduling them? Fit testing takes time, as I say, so you don't want people lined up back to back to back ready and waiting and, and that's time off the job. That is money to your business or organisation. Um, and what's the process with failures? Maybe with what products you selected, you can't get a pass. How do you handle the fails? What is your record keeping? Who's keeping the records? Where is your record keeping being recorded? Um, and then the requirements for repeat testing um, as well. So like I said, the, the fit testing part is, is the straightforward part. Once you've got them there, you know what you're fit testing on, where are you conducting the fit testing? So there's a lot there to think about to have a smooth running of your fit testing program. Fit testing takes time. Now, looking at the different protocols, probably the most common one up until the last year or so has been an OSHA protocol, which takes about seven to eight minutes. And now there's a new modified protocol, which is two and a half minutes for the actual fit test exercises when I talk about times. But with the aerosol taste test, there's the sensitivity test time frame. You need preparation of the face piece for the test. So you're changing respirators to have to probe different ones. There's requirements on the protocol to inform the wearer of the fit test exercises. We want to be showing them how to don and performing, performing the wearer's seal check. We have a mandatory five minute comfort assessment period for all the methodologies as well. Now there's the actual fit test, you know, all that times. We got the removal of the face test when we're explaining the results. You know, there may be some minor training on the selection. Now, if someone doesn't pass, we need to do additional fit tests and repeats. So all this adds up 
So typically, you know, for a seven to eight minute typical eight exercise um, OSHA protocol, it could be 20 to 25 minutes by the time going through that and following the steps. I mean, the, the biggest impact on fit testing, um, I, I believe, is not necessarily doing the test, like that gives us the number, but it's that information being passed on to the wearer, why it's so important to wear the respirator correctly each and every time. So it's kind of hard to go. It's going to take X amount of time every single time. So you need to be flexible and understanding to allow the process to take place for a reliable fit test outcome. Now, something I just sort of want to allude here is, you know, look, Mark, that's great. There's a lot of effort that goes into fit testing and it's becoming a requirement. What's the benefit to my workers? How can this be shown? So what I'm showing on the, the screen here is, um, a summary of some uh, data points from a number of different studies. So all those little dots here come from about 13 individual workplace protection factor studies where the workers were actually fit tested. Um, and here's some data points from I think about four studies where workers were not fit tested. So a reusable half face respirator, which was the style that all these studies they were being, uh, being looked at, um, has an assigned protection factor of 10. So if you think back to that required minimum protection factor, so at a minimum, a clean shaven fit tested train worker should at a minimum achieve at least a 10 times reduction in exposure. And that's what we use from our selection point of view in comparison to a workplace exposure standard. So all these data points here, what this is actually showing is that these individual workers were getting a thousand times reduction in exposure from outside the respirator to inside the respirator over their working shift. Here we have a 10,000 times reduction. And so what we're, so what we're saying here is that out of this 98% of all the workers who were fit tested in these studies achieved 10 or above from a reduction in exposure. That's fantastic. Versus these particular studies where workers were not fit tested, 55% of the workers achieved the 10 times reduction in exposure or above. So it's not saying that if you don't do fit testing, you're absolutely not going to be guaranteed the protection, but certainly from a confidence of what work is going to be achieved when they've been given the instruction, shown how to fit, you know, we're trying to take out that compatibility variability or what, what is suitable is going to be there. That's a huge difference as a health and safety professional, as a worker, I know I'm going to be wanting to lean on the, Hey, 98% achieved the required minimum number versus only 55%. That's a huge difference in, you know, adequate protection being achieved. You know, so imagine saying to your workers, gee, only 50% of you are going to achieve enough protection or not. I know personally, I wouldn't accept that. Um, as well, and neither should a workplace. That is just not good enough. So this is why fit testing is so critical and adds value to uh, respirator protection programs as well. Some of the other benefits that fit testing can bring into a workplace, um, I mean, right down to the basics, it's gonna select a respirator that is suitable for the wearer. Now it's not just, here's a respirator, off you go, it's gonna fit everybody the same, which is not gonna be the case. You know, there's that compatibility issues, but also the comfort. Someone may achieve a fit, but it may not be that comfortable for them. So fit testing allows that process to assess the comfort as well. It's a great training opportunity to reinforce, you know, they can achieve an acceptable fit. They know how a proper fit feels and it confirms that a respirator can be effective, you know, how and why and when to use uh, RPE, the impact of facial hair. So there's a lot of benefits that can, 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 fit testing can add to your program and having competent fit tested to have reliable fit testers adds this value to your, your workplace and your program as well. The HSC has some fantastic uh, studies that they've done over the previous years about factors influencing implementation of RPE programs. So if you're looking to delve a bit deeper, you're certainly uh, welcome to go hunt that out or get in contact with myself and very happy to um, share some of those links with you as well. The other part I just wanted to, to touch on um, you may be familiar about the user seal check um, and how does this compare to a fit test? So the fit test is what we've been talking about as a process. It's going to take that amount of time. There's a specific methodology, whereas a user seal check is the responsibility of the wearer that every time that respirator is done, be it's disposable, half face or full face, they're doing a quick check in, in, um, in as well as the fit test that has previously conducted, confirming, you know, very, uh, I guess, crude and simplistic way that a fit is being achieved. So 
a user seal check is not a substitute for a fit test. So I use a very simple analogy of a fit test is a bit like sizing up a shoe. We're going to fit up. We're going to see that that shoe fits you, your size, we're all different. But the user seal check is like doing up the laces every single time to hold it on and confirm that's going to be there. I hope that makes sense. It's a very simple analogy, but it goes hand in hand. Um, I know on the RestFit website, there's a whole bunch of studies where they've looked at looking to see um, how a user seal check or fit check compares to a fit, fit test as far as its reliability. Um, very clearly, it is not deemed as an equivalent. Hence why it's so critical that a fit test is conducted and the wearer is conducting that user seal check um, as well each and every time. Um, to wrap this all up here, hopefully you've, you've picked up a bit of information that you'll find useful going forward around respirator fit testing is that fit is a critical component in that protection being achieved on the job. Now you're thinking about those three different uh, things at the start about, you know, uh, wear time, filter, and uh, fit, that's a variable equation. How it gets worn in the morning to how it gets worn in the afternoon uh, has an impact on that fit. So we want our workers to know what to do and how to do that. Fit testing con confirms a fit can be achieved. It is not a guarantee that a fit is gonna be achieved every single time. That still relies on the wearer wearing it and doing the right things correctly every single time on the job. So fit testing is not a guarantee, but it goes a long way to say, hey, yes, this person is able to achieve a fit and provided they wear it in the same way, do the right things when they need to wear it, that protection is expected to be there. Fit testing is just one part of respiratory protection program, as I touched on the start from uh, 1715 or Australian standard, uh, New Zealand standard 1715, but it's a very important component from that selection to whether a person can achieve that fit and seal there respirators can be really effective. There's no doubt about it, but, but the effectiveness of that respiratory protective equipment relies on the correct selection and the level for the contaminant or hazard. It's got to fit the respirator mask fits the individual. It's going to be worn every single time. It's going to be worn properly each and every time. So there's a lot of things there that we're relying on the person to do the right things, which is where that training, um, your culture, the motivation of what, and why it's so critical where fit testing can really reinforce that protection can be achieved when they do the right things. And, and just to highlight, when we start talking about, you know, the hierarchy of control, we're looking at respirators and other PPE. If it's required as part of our control strategy in your workplace, it's no less important than any other uh, control strategy that you're employing um, in your workplace. Uh, too often over the years, um, I'll see PPE that's being used, but the workers or the workplace will go, oh, it's just PPE. We don't need to do too much around it. If anything, it needs the most because you're relying on behavior. So uh, please don't discount or think about that that's just PPE because it is still just as important and can be really, really effective. Um, I hope that you've uh, taken something away from the information. As I said, this is sort of a a, definitely a skim overview on fit testing, but I hope that I've highlighted the critical importance of fit and achieving protection and what you need as part of your respiratory protection program when it comes to fit testing and the resources that are out there, such as the RESP fit website um, are there to help all workplaces. If you've got any questions, please put them in, in the chat there. Um, I probably may have answered a couple um, as I've been uh, presenting this recorded video, but thank you for your time and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our final speaker in this extended webinar today is Peter Collignon. Peter was made a member of the Order of Australia uh, for Services to Medicine in Infectious Diseases, Microbiology and Infection Control in 2009. In addition to his role at ACT Pathology in Canberra Hospital, he is also a professor in the Medical School of the Australian National University. He is active in many public health advocacy issues, in particular antibiotic resistance, infection control, and hospital acquired infections. He is a member of many national and international committees, including as an expert to the World Health Organization on the issue of antibiotic resistance and the use of antibiotics in food animals since 2000. He is also the inaugural and current patron of the Australian College of Infection Prevention and Control. Gives me great pleasure to welcome Peter.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, I hope I can take you through a journey of um, COVID, and, um, but particularly why infection control and prevention is so important. And it particularly, obviously, uh, pertains to uh, people in the emergency services, a complete, and especially those in, um, um, you know, um, driving ambulances, basically, or in, involved in that uh, part. So essentially, I thought I'd go through where the situation is in Australia and then go on and um, speak specifically about some infection control issues um, themselves. And I guess the first question I'd ask, are we on the right track in Australia? And I'd like to say so far, the answer is yes. Um, we did have a, you know, an outbreak in Melbourne last winter, but compared to just about every other country in the world, we're doing very well, uh, along with New Zealand. We have had very limited um, spread in Australia. And when we have had spread, it's been controlled. And that's really in contrast to almost everywhere else in the world. So the short answer is yes, we are. Um, how do we keep on the right track? We might uh, discuss a bit later. So what about the present pandemic? Well, it's obviously global and it's in, you know, in large numbers globally and it's still happening everywhere. Um, there's issues with vaccine safety and efficacy I'll talk about because vaccines are the way we're going to get out of this problem. So they're a very important component. Where is Australia going to be, you know, after we have a lot of vaccines rolled out, you know, does life go back to normal or where does it go to? You know, I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19, its variants and mutations, et cetera. And the other issue is if you get immunized or get infected, you know, how long does that immunity last? Does that mean you're right for the rest of your life or where we're at now? I'll try and answer a, a lot of these as we go on. Now, where is Australia? Um, well, this is the epidemic curve for Australia. And basically, um, you know, that first um, 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 peak there was last year in March, April, when you know COVID was first really traveling around the world and spread. And we had quite a number of cases per day, but mainly overseas return travelers and people on cruise ships, for instance, which seemed to be uh, a good way of um, spreading it from one person to another. That second um, peak is actually predominantly all Melbourne. Um, the rest of the time for the rest of Australia, if you look at the baseline, we see these little wobbles and it goes up for a while and then comes down again. That's really where most of Australia has been, which is remarkable uh, and, and you know very good. So we should actually, I guess, thank our lucky stars it's been like that. Um, and the question is, how do we keep it like that? Um, quarantine and uh, recognising people with infections is obviously a part, but well, or major part, but we'll go on. Now, I, this just tells you how many cases there are in different states and territories. And I'm not sure you have to look at all the fine print, but essentially the largest number of cases were in Victoria because of the community spread there last winter. And there were a number of factors involved in that we might discuss that I think have been fixed up. Um, so there's less chance that it's happening now, but it's not an impossible chance that we could have it in, you know, any state in Australia for that matter. Um, so we do need to keep vigilant. Um, if we take the Victorian um, figures out of it, the vast majority of people who've been infected are people that we've found to be infected by testing, people who've come back to Australia from overseas and their immediate contacts. Um, there's been some community spread, but that's been a minority if we, um, you know, and it's been controlled by good testing, cooperation of a general public, um, and basically isolation, uh, quarantining, et cetera, has been very successful so far in Australia. And relatively speaking, one of the reasons it's been so successful, we um, basically had more testing available per population than a lot of other countries, including Europe and the US, back March and April uh, last year, a lot to do with our public health laboratories, organising and fixing up their own tests rather than relying on commercial tests. And then I think very good public health reactions with quarantining, isolating, really um, finding all the contacts have been very effective and remains so far very effective as well. Um, if we look at the people in Australia who've been infected, you can see it's mainly the 20 to 40 year olds are the biggest uh, group that have been infected and relatively equally females and males. So, um, and that's in contrast with this next slide, 
um, which uh, basically shows where the deaths occur. So in contrast, if you, if you look here, the previous slide, you know, it's the 20 to 40 year olds that have the most infection and presumably spread the most, but the biggest effect is on those who are older. And in Australia, as everywhere else in the world, the vast majority of people who die are over the age of 70. Um, you know, you're at risk really basically if you're over the, 50, over the age of 50, but your risk goes up very uh, proportionately to your age. And while you can say, well, there's not many more 90 year olds dying than there are 80 year olds, that's because there's less 90 year olds because of, you know, uh, the average age in Australia is now about 84, 85. So a lot of people have died from other causes. So, but uh, basically the older you are, um, your risk goes up substantially. Now, one of the problems is working out what the actual death rate is from uh, COVID is, is actually difficult. Um, this is, uh, the next biggest or the biggest uh, pandemic we've had for 100 years. Uh, the last one that was a major issue was um, the 1918 uh, Spanish flu. And the reason it was called Spanish flu, it didn't originate in Spain. It probably originated in the US in Kansas. Or, um, but it was called Spanish flu because Spain was um, neutral in World War One. And so the first time it ever got into the media was when it was actually in Spain. There was Newcastle news articles about it because when it was in, you know, Germany behind the German lines, the French lines, the and America censorship meant it couldn't be discussed. So um, you know, the Spanish flu was a bit unfortunate people on Spain, but um, it, you know that's where it was first reported from. What was interesting about the Spanish flu? is the group that died more often wasn't 80 and 90 year olds, it was actually 20 and 30 year olds. So while the Spanish flu probably overall had a one or 2% uh, case fatality rate, that means people who die, we identify the, the cases. The age distribution is very, di very different. Um, COVID is causing deaths in essentially the same age group as influenza does, mainly people over the age of 70. Um, but it does so at, I think, 20 to 30 times higher rate uh, than influenza. So, you know, it behaves like influenza, but it is much, much worse uh, in forms of morbidity and mortality. Um, if we actually look at this another way, this is a paper that tried to look at what we call the infection fatality rate, because you can sometimes, well, frequently overestimate the mortality rate because you're just looking at cases and basically, people who are really sick are the ones that turn up to hospital and get, you know, transported. And so they do die more often. But you may be missing a lot of, you know, mild cases that just got better by themselves. So this was an attempt to work out, you know, what is the case fatality or the infection fatality rate, sorry, where, of people who may have had mild disease based on serology and a whole lot of other issues as well. Because probably in most countries, for every one case you found by testing, there were another 10 you missed at least because you know they didn't get around to testing or it wasn't available. Anyway, using that methodology, if you look at um, an 85 year old, you've actually probably got a one in three chance of dying if you get COVID, so very high. Um, if you're an 80 year old, you probably got about a, you know, a one in 10 chance of dying. Um, it's the, the first column after the age group if you look at it. Well, even, you know, if you're a 60 year old, it's about oh, one in, you know, 12, one in, it's, you know, about 1%, one in 100, one in two or 300, it's sort of that order. So, you know, at all these ages, um, there is a risk of dying and it's not inconsiderable. Although if you're a 30 year old, it's probably one in 10,000. So, you know, much less. And that's sort of comparable to your rate of dying from say an automobile accident or an accidental, um, you know, injury from, you know, I guess falling off a ladder or something. But it's in the older age groups where COVID fatality rate, even with taking into account the asymptomatic infection, just exponentially rises. And that's got a lot of significance of how you roll out vaccines. And it's why it's very important that we really get the over 70 year olds vaccinated and really the over 50 year olds because if you do that with vaccines that are reasonably safe and effective and the vaccines we've got are quite effective at stopping you dying and getting into hospital you will stop a huge amount of the deaths you know you'll be 90 percent plus effective 
at decreasing the number of deaths you see. So instead of a thousand deaths, you'll still have deaths, but it'll be a hundred. So vaccines are vitally important to roll out in particular to the people most at risk if we're trying to stop people from dying and getting very uh, very ill there's other reasons for vaccines as well in younger people including decreasing the chance of transmission but we'll talk about that a bit later now what's happening in the rest of the world you know australia is still in a really good position as is as is uh, new zealand um but um basically um it's you know, not looking flash is putting it mildly. Um, this is the latest data from a day or so ago. And if you look at the top one, gives the total number of cases per day, per per day, and essentially, you know, lots. And you know, it, it's it, it's quite still high. In fact, it's higher than it's ever been. Now, some of that may be because we've got more testing available, so you're finding it. But if you look at the bottom part of this graphic, which is deaths, um, and you know, basically that's a bit more accurate at, at working out who is actually, um, you know, had COVID in a population because overall you probably get one in 100 people dying or one in, you know, 200. So that the deaths are still very high. So from the Australian perspective, the rest of the world has got large amounts of COVID spreading. I mean, you, you, you see it in in the media with India, but it's, it, you know, in lots of countries, even when they look like they're doing well, you say, oh, Europe's looking much better. They've still got quite a few cases per, per day. And the other important thing about this is, this is a disease that's likely to become end endemic. In other words, we have epidemics, they come and they disappear. But if it's endemic, it means it's there. Um, and this is likely almost forever or for a long period of time, this disease is likely to become endemic. In other words, it'll be at low levels in the population, spreading slowly at low numbers, not causing as much destruction because there's a lot of immunity or a lot of vaccination giving immunity, but they're in low numbers, which actually then means if, for instance, from Australia, you go overseas and come back, well, you're very likely to maybe bring it back. And if you then have got a population who is not vaccinated, you can actually see what you've seen in the US or Britain before, large numbers of people spreading infection to lots of people. So getting some sort of immunity is really important. You can do it by, you know, just letting the disease rip, so to speak, which I think is a really bad idea because of the deaths that recur from that. Or you can protect your population by giving them immunity via vaccines that are safe and effective. And that is obviously a much uh, preferable strategy or way to go. Um, i just give you a couple of examples in Europe. You know, this is um, the left-hand panel there is Sweden. It's often put up as, uh, look, you don't do what Sweden has done. It fits in the middle of the European um, answer or, or results read deaths and cases. Um, it's not the worst, it's not the best. It sits in the middle per capita with deaths and, and cases. Germany is often put up as a better example and in fact, while the scales, the y-axis scales here are different for the right-hand side, uh, they still are having a lots of cases per day. Um, um, so, um, you know, and overall, the, if you look at the, the two bumps or peaks in these graphs, they're very similar, which, you know, implies there are things to do with, you know, I think winter in particular, where people are indoors in crowded situations, because every respiratory virus spreads more rapidly in, or easily in winter. Um, and, you know, very similar graphs and, and basically everybody's had different approaches. There's all these arguments about lockdowns and I think you do need lockdowns if you've got lots of spread. But how much you restrictions you put on, that's still something we haven't worked out that will be a subject of ongoing controversy and hopefully by looking at lots of countries we can unravel it a little bit. Now, this is what's happening in Taiwan. Now, the reason I put this up is Taiwan is a similar population to Australia. I think it's got 29 million, we've got 26 million. And Taiwan was an example of probably the best performing country in the world, better than Australia. They didn't have their spread like we had in Melbourne last winter. But currently, um, via, I might say, it seems pilots going to um, some, uh, well, I, th I think they were, you know, um, sex clubs or some, a um, place that uh, people didn't want to actually say they went to. But basically, COVID got introduced past their quarantine and border restrictions into the country. And they're now getting a few hundred cases per day or more, not too dissimilar 
that Melbourne was last uh, winter. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that obviously is a problem for them. Um, they were very into, you know, um, appropriately quarantining, hotel quarantining and keeping it out and did so very successfully, more so than New Zealand and Australia, I might add yet they've now got an outbreak. And if I look at other countries that were very good previously as well, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, um, all of them are getting outbreaks. So I actually think this view that we can keep this virus out of Australia forever and a day by having hotel quarantine or quarantine, um, look, I think we can really make a dent and it decreases the risk as far as I can see our hotel quarantine system, even with its faults has probably decreased the risk by a factor of about 100, um, decreased the chance that it will spread through the community. But the risk is not zero. And this is a real issue about vaccine hesitancy. Oh, look, I'll wait till there's a better vaccine available in six months' time or a year's time. I think that's a major mistake, particularly if you're over the age of 50, because this can just come and spread so rapidly when you think everything is fine. And I think Taiwan is a good example of that and how we've got to be careful. Um, you know, my own view is um, what do you do about lockdowns and restrictions and all the rest? Um, this is from over a year ago, this opinion piece, but I haven't changed. New Zealand was very much locked down, eliminated, and you won't have a problem. Well, New Zealand has had um, at least, you know, a number of reintroductions where it spreads. Um, and I might say, uh, and this is where politics all comes in, this, and you'd hope it could get out, um, or the politics could get out. But the strategy that I believe is the most likely to succeed in the medium to long term, and I realise this won't be accepted by all and is controversial, is basically suppression to really low levels. And it's what New South Wales is doing. They're basically putting in restrictions and, you know, what you need to do. So you find all the cases, you have some limited... Uh, lockdowns like the northern beaches when you've got large numbers of cases, particularly where you don't know they're coming from. But they've actually achieved the same result, which is essentially elimination for periods of time. The virus disappears as far as we can tell in the community, but then it gets reintroduced and they hit it again. So this is a bit like, you know, thump a mole every time it comes up. And I think we need to continue to do that until we have a large proportion of the population immunised so that the consequences are, you know, markedly down and that's not going to be realistically till the end of this year. But I, I actually think that approach is better. I also don't agree with the Swedish approach was, oh, we'll take minimal restrictions and just protect the, you know, people who are older because their death rate per population is about 20 times higher than we've had in Australia. So I, I, I think that if you like the two extremes are putting up, I don't actually agree with either of them. The only thing I'd make the comment is that really the New Zealand approach has been now adopted by every state and territory in Australia other than New South Wales. And I'm not still sure that they've had better results than New South Wales, particularly if you look at the number of return visitors from overseas New South Wales has done and actually has actually kept it under control, um, even though they've had much higher risks than every other state. Um, now, what about vaccines? Well, basically, I think we've got a number of very good vaccines as regards safety and efficacy. Um, the two main ones, well, really the only two ones we've got in Australia at the moment, is one based on messenger RNA, which is a new type of um, vaccine that really hasn't been used before. Um, and it basically, uh, and that's the Pfizer one, and essentially um, it's getting the body to produce um, the protein that we react to. And the other one is the AstraZeneca one, which is again, delivering a, a blueprint to the body to actually make a vaccine. And this particular graphic that I think came from, BB, from the BBC, if you look at the top line there, it's the AstraZeneca one. Now that's the one being made in Australia. Um, it, it's supposedly a million doses now a week. Um, and for the last two weeks, that should be as many doses that are available in Australia because it, once you make it, it's caught up in quality assurance and quality um, um, control issues for about four weeks before it's released after the T our TGA gives approval. But essentially, it's a vaccine that uses a modified chimpanzee adenovirus to deliver a DNA to our body where we then read that and we make a thing called the spike protein, which coats the outside of the virus. And that's what we 
basically make an immune response to. Our white cells see it, we make antibodies, and our white cells get turned on. And essentially, nearly all the vaccines we've got rely on that particular aspect. Um, we make antibodies and white cells that react to the spike protein. Uh, the messenger RNA does it another way because it delivers the messenger RNA to our um, you know, body through the injection. And we then um, form that protein, it, probably in our lymph nodes mainly, and then our body sees it, reacts to it, and makes antibodies to the spike protein. The uh, AstraZeneca one does it the same way, but by delivering DNA. And the difference with that is DNA is much more stable than RNA. So the real problem with the RNA uh, vaccines, which are the second and third line in this slide I've got up there, is they're not very stable. So you've got to keep them at freezing temperatures, minus 20, and for Pfizer one, minus 70. Now that's a real problem because that makes a, an ultra cold chain much harder to deliver, not that you can't do it, but it's the reason it's mainly just given in centres by state health departments because it's not very practical to have it rolled out by GPs, for instance, or uh, other clinics um, that nurses run or, you know, pharmacists, for instance. And that's why the AstraZeneca is such a good vaccine. It is basically much lower cost, but it's particularly stable at refrigeration temperatures for long periods of time, which means it is the sort of vaccine you need to go around the world, that type, if you want to be able to inoculate and vaccinate billions of people. So there's a lot of um, you know publicity about which vaccine is better or not better. Um, and I might go into some of that, I think, on the next slide I've got. Um, and particularly with the AstraZeneca, it's all about these blood clots that form. Now, um, blood clots that we normally think about in your legs and pulmonary emboli, that isn't associated with any of the vaccines and also not the AstraZeneca. What is associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine is this unusual clotting that occurs basically in the head and the abdomen where you get clotting but with really low platelets. So it's sort of some um, autoimmune um, type reaction. It occurs about probably one in 100,000 people, or they may occur more often when you're younger. Um, and about one in a million people, um, so one in 10 people with those clots die from it. So it is associated with death. But I think with too many of these things, we get it out of proportion. Um, um, I'm much to my surprise, about one in a million people in Australia die from a lightning uh, strike. Uh, or that's their risk from a lightning death each, each, uh, each year. So, yeah, look, there's no doubt there's a risk with the AstraZeneca vaccine of dying with a side effect that's due to the vaccine. And it probably is, is higher when you're younger. So if you're a 30-year-old, it's a higher risk than you're a 70-year-old, which um, is why they're saying we're mainly recommending AstraZeneca vaccine for those over the age of 50. And those under the age of 50, yes, they can have the AstraZeneca vaccine, but if you've got a vaccine that doesn't have this side effect, such as the Pfizer uses that, the Pfizer vaccine has anaphylaxis associated, probably about one in 20, one in 30,000 people. But that's why you keep the people in the immunisation centre and you can resuscitate them and basically the deaths don't occur and that problem goes away. So all these vaccines have side effects, but we've got to then put it in perspective. Okay, there's a one, you're an 80 year old, and there's a one in a million chance that if I get vaccinated, I might die as a result of the vaccine. But if you get COVID, there's a one in 10 chance you'll die from the disease. Now, you can say, well, if we never get COVID, you know, that's a risk I don't have to take. But I think stating or thinking that you'll never get COVID as a problem is a big ask, and I think not actually realistic. So basically, I think we've got very effective vaccines. They're all 90% plus effective at stopping you dying and getting um, admitted to hospital. Uh, but, by, but, but essentially um, have got side effects, but really rare compared to the benefits that you're likely to get if you have any spread. And UK and Scotland have got very good data on this. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but this basically is a recent paper that comes out and essentially shows in the real world rather than just looking at trials with lower numbers, the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines seem to be equally effective at stopping you getting most disease in England and Scotland. Um, the references are there for people that want to look up it later. Uh, what about in Australia? What's it going to look like post-vaccination? Well, 
One of the problems with vaccines is none of them are 100% perfect. And, uh, and also they're less perfect at stopping spread. So the real issue about vaccination in my mind is decreasing the probability that people will die, that will overload hospitals or get very seriously sick. And the vaccines are very good at doing that. Will people still get mild disease? Yes, they do. They do with all the vaccines and the Pfizer one may be better than the AstraZeneca at stopping that, but none of them are 100%. So we're gonna to have to come to some realization at some time, and I think this will be at least not before another six to nine months, that at some stage we will have protected people very well from dying, but we can't you know, basically stop the spread of this infection completely. And that's sort of a, a discussion I think we're gonna to have to have and how we get around to that because I don't think we can become a hermit nation for the next five years. I do think we're going to have to have strong border protection for at least for this year and probably till this time next year, but we can maybe discuss that in questions and answers. Um, the other issue is about variants and, and um, you know, mutations, etc. cetera. Um, I might say, if you look at, uh, I think a lot of this is overblown. Uh, I think the short answer is we don't have all the answers either, but you, you might remember all the UK variant, oh, this is the end of the world and, you know, we won't be able to control it. The reality of the vaccines in England and Scotland, where the UK variant was mainly, was just as efficacious really against those that strain as the original strain. Um, people with the UK strain are probably more infectious, probably because they have the virus in their pharynx for another day rather than that it's more virulent or anything. What about the Indian variant? Well, we don't have enough data but so far in England, the vaccines do seem to have been reasonably effective against that, but it's limited data. Now, um, basically, um, you know, are the vaccines we've got now going to work, continue to work against all the strains? I don't know, but I don't think there's good evidence that they're not so far. And given all these vaccines at the end work about getting around this spike protein and making protection, unless that spike protein markedly changes, and I might say it does it a lot less than influenza, I would think we should assume that we'll get quite reasonable protection from their vaccines for a reasonable period of time, although we've got to accept we just have to keep on doing real world studies and work out where it goes. Um, now, does infection with COVID give you an immunity? Well, yes, to a large degree. If you get infected, you probably will be protected from that strain and other strains. But again, it's not complete and probably the same issue with um, vaccines. In Denmark, they did a study and basically, if you'd been infected before, you had a very low probability of getting infected a second time, as judged by PCR molecular testing. But, as, you know, but some people did actually, basically. So, you know, there were a group of people that got, sec got seemed to get a second infection, but much less than if you'd never had an infection in the first place. So, yes, and one presumes the same for immunisation. Um, now, what about infection control and prevention? This is the crux of all of this, in my view. Um, this in, you know, we tend to think of this in, you know, hospitals and healthcare, but this whole issue is how do we stop people getting infected and how do we stop it spreading? Um, and essentially, um, you know, this is from WHO. And, you know, there are things that really increase your risk. And that's basically being in crowded places near lots of other people. Uh, close contact setting, being very close to them, and being confined in enclosed spaces. So basically being outdoors is, you know, much, much safer than being indoors. There are very few outbreaks if, you know, that you can attribute to when people are just outdoors, even when some of them said, oh, look, here's a camping trip in the US where people got infected. Well, they were indoors in the entertainment areas a lot of those times as well. So being outdoors seems to be very protective. Um, um, and, you know, there's argument about what all the factors are there, but there's no doubt being outdoors is. Um, being indoors is a problem, particularly if you haven't got protective um, equipment on and you're near people who are, uh, are sick, and there's all these issues about asymptomatic and symptomatic infections. The reality is that most infections are spread by people who've got symptoms, coughing, sneezing, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, some infection is spread by uh, people who are asymptomatic and maybe 20% of people are asymptomatic, but overall symptomatic people probably spread 90% of the infection. So, you know, that's where you concentrate to get your risk reduction. So these three Cs are really important. And obviously when they overlap, like the middle of those three circles, that has much more 
an issue um, than if they don't. Now, um, for those that might be interested, I, this paper, you know, I got asked to write it months ago, and in fact, it took three months to come out from the Australian College of Physicians and it's open access. But basically there, I try and look at, well, we've got a current pandemic, what about future pandemics? The bottom line is we need physical protection um, and physical distancing, keeping crowds down, et cetera, et cetera, if we want to control the spread of any infections and in particular pandemics and using appropriate uh, personal protective equipment and vaccination as a strategy. But none of them by themselves fixes the entire problem. It's all in together in different proportions. And one of the things we have to look at is what is the risk versus what we do and how we make our risk low. And I think accepting we can never have a zero risk, but there's lots of things we can do to make the risk lower. Um, and, you know, and, and often they're basically in some part common sense. Now, there is a big controversy about um, spread of uh, COVID and you, you know, you, a lot, most of you have heard this droplets versus aerosol debate. Now, um, can COVID be spread by aerosols? And by aerosols, I mean very small particles, less than five microns that can travel large distance, meaning 10, 20, 30 um, meters, who's, that stay in the air potentially for hours. Um, now, I actually think most of the evidence suggests the vast majority of COVID is spread by close personal, um, you know, contact. And what we attribute droplets to, one of the problems is people do use different definition of droplets and aerosols. Some use 100 microns but uh, for an aerosol. But the bottom line is it's when you're up close and personal in confined spaces. And to my mind, our concept of dro droplets explains the vast majority of spread, not all of the spread, let me make it clear. And I think some of our concepts are also wrong. Um, you know, droplets all drop within one and a half metres. Well, usually that's true, but not always. If you've got a breeze behind you, you've got a problem. If you're in a positive pressure room, for instance, some hotel rooms, and you open the door and it goes into the corridor, well, some of those um, droplets that are bigger will, you know, spread into there as well. Um, but the bottom line of this is that my belief is that if you wear a surgical mask and eye protection, you markedly decrease your risk in most circumstances of getting this infection. So masks work. And one of the issues with aerosols, in theory, if aerosols are a big factor, surgical and cloth masks don't work to protect the individual. They may still work to stop you spreading it to others. And if I look at some of the um, you know slides you see of people wearing um, P2 masks, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, a lot of them have outflow valves to make it easier to wear. But the trouble is that's fine if you're working with asbestos because people, for instance, never exhale uh, asbestos. But if you're looking at a respiratory infection, you want a mask that both stops you breathing it in, but you also need a mask that stops you spraying it out to others. So these one-way valves are, are, are not appropriate infection control um, if you're using... Uh, an N95 mask. Anyway, and, and essentially this graphic. Now I'll go on to my next slide. Um, how does COVID spread? Well, it can spread in lots of ways. I might say you might remember at the beginning of this epidemic, people really worried about hands and hand hygiene. And I might say I push that too, because I think it's important for lots of reasons. But at the end of the day, even though there's lots of data that says oh, the virus can hang around for five days on surfaces and it's here and it's there. Hands do not seem to be a major way it's spread. Um, not that you can't, you can touch your eye and touch your nose and touch your mouth and it will be a factor, but nowhere near as big as I was expecting, for instance. The other way um, that potentially it could spread is through faeces because um, you can find this virus at least by PCR and a lot of faeces. And in fact, that's what our sewage testing is all about, which I think is a good idea. But again, while you, you know, you undoubtedly could probably spread it occasionally with plumbing that's a problem because SARS-1 was spread that way, it doesn't appear to be a major way of spreading it, thank goodness, because you can remember, you can think about it in a lot of uh, developing countries or poorer countries, there's so much contaminated water, that would be a real issue. So the major way it spreads is through the air. And it's predominantly by droplets in my view, but aerosols play a factor as well, you know, very small particles. It brings up this issue about face masks, surgical masks versus N95 respirators, et cetera, and 
fit testing and fit checking that you know Mark had gone into uh, in detail. And also this issue has spread the more than two metres. But the bottom line is most of the infections are spread even in workplaces. Yes, you can get it from patients, um, but a lot of the spread is workmates giving it to each other and the predominant spread is within the home where people are not wearing any PPE most of the time or in the workplace, you know, you're in the tea room or in a car with somebody and you spread it. Now, the air is an issue if you've got poor circulation in enclosed spaces, and that's an issue for ambulance drivers, I think, in particular, or people in ambulances. And there is an issue there of having more uh, protection, maybe against aerosols if you're in a confined space for a long period of time. Um, so it's not that, you know, I, I'm suggesting that we don't actually look at, you know, N95 respirators, etc. cetera, but uh, I still believe the predominant spread is by droplets. And if you then wear a surgical mask and wear eye protection, it significantly decreases your risk. And one of the examples I give for that is New South Wales Health until recently or until four or five months ago, their quarantine medi hotels, they've had over a thousand people there for two weeks. Their basic PPE was a surgical mask and eye protection in the form of a face shield. And my understanding is they haven't had any spread in that high risk environment by doing that. It's been actually transport of people that's been more of an issue or in uh, quarantine hotels that haven't had necessarily the same level of protection. Because when I look at photos of quarantine hotel, and I think the, the photo Mark put up of the policeman wearing the N95 mask sideways, what was obvious, first of all, he had a beard, so protection and sealing wasn't an issue, wasn't, wouldn't work, but also no eye protection. And I keep on seeing photos of people wearing PPE, supposedly in high-risk situations, and not having eye protection on. Um, and eyes are a very good way of both aerosols and droplets dropping into your eye, and via your nasolacrimal drug, very quickly gets into your nose. So I think eyes are very much underappreciated. Surfaces, well, that's an issue too. Um, that goes with hands, but again, not a very common way of spread on the available data we have so far. Not that I don't think you should wash your hands and use alcohol hand rub, but it's really your mouth, your nose and your eyes you need to most protect. And um, there's an article for those interested where this is a link that I co-wrote with somebody a few months ago, just pointing out how we're really missing protecting our eyes. Um, and I think to our detriment, and I keep on seeing healthcare situations in country where it's under control, you know, they may not have masks on properly, but even if they're wearing masks, their eyes are unprotected. And there's data from China, for instance, that people wearing just ordinary glasses had a much lower risk of COVID than did um, people uh, who you know, basically had no eye protection at all. Now, you might be pleased to know this is my last slide, and it comes from that paper I commented on that... Um, um, you know, looked at, well, how do we protect ourselves from the spread of COVID? And basically, there's lots of things we can do. And it's not only for COVID, it's for lots of other things as well. Um, and essentially, you know, anything we can do to decrease the direct or indirect spread of COVID, especially by droplets. And the reason I concentrate on droplets is if, for instance, as some people believe, I might say I don't, but some people believe this is mainly spread by aerosols, my view would be, well, how can you have public transport at all if it's mainly aerosols? Because masks are not going to protect you much. And if it stays in the air for hours, well, if you go into this enclosed space, you would see large numbers of people infected, but you don't. You still see it mainly people who are close by. How can you open a building where you've got people with, you know, sharing the same air conditioning? So I actually think, thankfully, most of the spread seems to be by droplets, which means there's practical things you can do to stop that happening. Wearing a surgical mask, eye protection, keeping your distance, keeping crowds down, et cetera, et cetera. All of that will make a, a large amount of difference. And that is basically the public health messaging. And when it's followed, it does seem to make a lot of difference. Um, fo following it all the time is difficult. In your own house, for instance, how do you do that? You have to make an effort to keep away from those things. I think the other big factor that we've been very poor at doing is we soldier on. You know, this, I was involved in another study done with pre-COVID, something like, you know, 20 or 30% of doctors and nurses would go to work even if they had a fever of 38 with a respiratory illness. 
we really do need people who are sick keeping away as much as possible from their own family members and friends um, as much as you can practically do that but not coming to work because that is a major way this spreads. If you look at a lot of the outbreaks, it's particularly even in restaurants, it's been where there's a staff member, often have to go to work because they're poorly paid, who then spread it to lots of people coming into that restaurant or you know bar. And, and, and particularly if you've got people who've got a respiratory illness where there's a lot of alcohol and you're sitting for long periods of time, bars being a good example, that's a good way of doing it. The other thing you do have to do is limit the movement of people. Um, this works actually even for things like cholera. Um, it makes a difference if you don't let people move widely because then they contaminate less water. But particularly for respiratory illnesses, you need to do that. Now, you can argue how much we need to do that with internal border closures and external border closures. And I think we need to have a better risk um, perspective here. But essentially, you limit the number of people, having only five people to your home instead of 20 people, et cetera, et cetera. All of that makes a difference for the risk and probability that you will transmit anything to other people. And the other thing that's really important, people that are infected need to be kept away as much as possible from others or have got a high probability of infection. And that's where quarantine comes in. You know, people returning from overseas, maybe one or two in a hundred might have or develop COVID when they come back. But you do need to put them in facilities that keep them away from others because you don't know which of those it is. Now, again, where you draw the line can be arguable. Um, I personally think when Victoria closed its borders and put anybody last Christmas even from regional New South Wales into a hotel quarantine, in my estimate, the risk of any of them having it would have been less than one in a million. So we can argue about what the risk level should be, but there's no doubt that the concept of um, keeping people with a risk of infection or at some reasonable level away from others um, makes a difference. And I basically think we're gonna to have to keep on doing that at least for people coming from high prevalence countries, which is most of the rest of the world, for at least till the end of this year, and I suspect it may be for another 12 months. So at this stage, I might stop and uh, revert to the chair and just see um, how we go to question and answers. Many thanks, Peter. Um, just wait for the, uh, our other two presenters to join us. Um, welcome, Ed. And uh, is Mark joining us? Yeah, he is. Great, welcome, Mark. Firstly, thank you all for your presentations today. Uh, very informative. The um, chat in the chat box um, has been highly complimentary about the content. Um, outstanding presentation from all is, is what they're saying. So well done, and thank you very much for sharing your, um, your knowledge and insights with us today. Um, it's a very uh, topical topic, of course, for us in the ambulance sector. And it's something that um, I think we're going to be facing for some time to come yet. I have a few questions uh, from the audience and from myself, so um, I'll try and share them out evenly. Um, Peter, can I start with you, please? Um, we are seeing a higher incidence of new variants than we would normally expect to see. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, again, I'm not quite sure we're seeing it as much as it's made out. I mean, if you look at any bacteria, Staph aureus or E. coli, they change with time. In fact, one of the big, the only advantage so far of uh, this outbreak is that you've been able to get molecular biology done much more quickly, mm -hmm. even in, in, in our labs. And we use, you know, molecular biology to fingerprint staph. And if you look at staph or Klebsiella E. coli in hospitals, there are changes with time so that we can say, hey, this is an outbreak due to this E. coli and it's different to that one. So it's a natural phenomena that the, 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 there's variation in the genetic code and uh, that's inevitable. To me, the real issue is, does the spike protein change so much that we don't recognize it with our immune system or with our vaccine? And, or our tests for that matter, that was an issue with some of the PCR tests if you just you know, look at one bit. But, Basically, um, I don't actually, I think the variants are put up, um, what, what was interesting with, you might remember a few months ago, there was a Russian variant that we're worried about. It was in mm. Queensland with their quarantine hotels. I tried to look up a bit about it and I found a quote from the Russian health minister who said, oh, we're really worried about variants. This British variant is a really bad variant. So to some degree, um, you know, not that that's not an issue, but 
I think it's given a sense of fear that's out of proportion to really the available data. Some of the early data in you know, the South African variant and the Brazilian variant, oh, look, this looks like a problem. But so far, we don't have good data that the vaccines in particular won't work. And as far as I can see, the transmission is still the same way. It may be that you're infectious for a day longer, but the basics we need to do stay the same. And so far, the medications we've got, but particularly, um, you know, the vaccines we've got, there's not good evidence that they don't work. That's very reassuring. Thank you. And Mark, I've just been thinking about the challenges the um, ambulance sector face, and particularly our frontline workforce paramedics. You know, when, when the pandemic started, you know, PPE was something that was tucked into a cupboard down the back of the ambulance or over the top of the driving cab, wasn't used that often. And suddenly they were using PPE for every single job. And of course, uh, the, su the supply chain dried up pretty quickly. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on how we might manage that going forward, recognizing that it's unlikely that we're going to see a single mask available for a paramedic. They're going to see a lot of different masks. And how does fit testing um, work in that scenario? Uh, you cut out a couple of times. So I hope I got the gist of uh, uh, your, your question there. But certainly at the start of the pandemic, supply was a challenge for the whole the whole world. The the increase in the I guess the healthcare world of things, including ambulance, obviously was a considerable jump up from what you alluded to. With obviously we're not using it that much. Um, I know certainly. Um, over time, I'd say most manufacturers now have improved the supply lines, you know, uh, across the globe. But obviously, that's taken a, a long time to to get to get to that point in time, and obviously, be be um, thinking ahead with that. There's obviously different types of respiratory protection. We look at the, I guess, disposable or filtering face piece respirators that are probably typically used in healthcare N95 oh. respirators. There are other styles such as reusable respirators where that one filter. Um, certainly can be used, um, you know, over a period of time, but certainly it comes with the cleaning, disinfection, cleaning side of things where we think about a disposable, it can be disposed between patients from that infection control versus now it may be a single product. So it's certainly going to be an, an ongoing challenge. And even in the industrial world of things, pre-pandemic, one style never fit everyone the same anyway. Mm. So you found most workplaces had a number of sizes and styles to accommodate um, you know, their, their, their workforce or their cohort in that particular regard. What you really want to, you know, ideally is find a style or brand that fits the majority of people when we think of the fit testing and then try and look at that smaller number. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to be an ongoing challenge with a mix of, of products and styles. But hopefully you find one that fits the majority to help with that logistical and manager, managerial side of supply um, with, with, with that as well. So it is a challenge for sure. Mm. To follow on from that, Mark, um, a new expression has entered our vocabulary, which is PPE fatigue. And um, I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that and how um, we can, I guess, minimise that occurring. Even from a general PPE approach, whether it's respirators or safety eyewear, typically when we look at the selection of, of any type of PPE, it sort of can break it down to is the PPE adequate and is the PPE suitable? So there's going to be a lot of times where a piece of PPE may be adequate. And I'll, you, you know, dust as a very broad example, where a disposable, reusable, full face, PAPR are all adequate in, in, in that context. But we need to look at the specific suitability requirements of the situation, what that may be. And that obviously factors in fit as well. The length of time that a wearer is expected to wear a piece of PPE. Certainly, it's not impossible to wear a reusable respirator for many hours, but the suitability and comfort of that person wanting to continue to wear it um, is is going to be a challenge. So I guess it comes down to that PPE fatigue is looking at that selection of what you're doing, the time that you're wearing it, what are your communication requirements to try and select something that may be more suitable. I often use the term, I don't think our marketing people like me using this term, but how do you find the product that is the most bearable? You know, it's not like yeah, they use, love to use the term comfortable in all the marketing brochures and, and flyers because obviously you're trying to, you know, put that feature out there, but you're not wearing a respirator to bed because it's so comfortable you don't want to take it off. So how do you find that product combination for what you need to do to protect you but also be 
suitable for what you're doing that is as bearable as possible to protect you but still allow you to do what you need to do in the context of where you need to do that and you know my limited knowledge of you know as far as the general public the ambulance you will be responding anywhere at any time depending on a range of circumstances so um, you're not in the one location in a very controlled environment it is quite diverse so that does add a, a challenge to that suitability um, side of things of PPE. Absolutely and I think we've learned a lot over these last 18 months. Um, Ed, you, your presentation um, was fascinating and I'm really interested around you know, Zika. Do you think there's a likelihood that that could um, emerge in Australia, particularly in our tropical climate? Um, well, there's, there's always a possibility, I suppose. Um, but, but one of the, the good things about um, the coronavirus pandemic is that we're, um, you know, or it's a double-edged sword really, but we're, we're in country where we're not traveling back and forth uh, around tropical areas. Um, you know, international travel has, has almost, almost stopped effectively. Um, so that's where a lot of these diseases tend to spread from. It, it's from that increased international travel you know, you might have a, a spillover event that's local to a certain region, but then then tends to to spread via via travel uh, outward to larger communities, into metro areas, and then from those cities into other cities overseas. Um, so at the moment, I think it, it, there's fairly low risk of something like that happening, and, and something um, fairly serious and and as widespread as that um, Zika epidemic was. Um, but I think um, more broadly, uh, we need to be aware of, of the fact that um, there have been Zika cases uh, in PNG. There have been um, cases of, of quite dangerous um, viruses that are that are spreading um, uh, into into Australia. Um, uh, we're very close to, to PNG, and PNG is very close to a lot of other places. And, and with such rich biodiversity that you see in uh, in places like um, PNG and, and tropical far north Queensland, uh, the the likelihood of, of um, new diseases developing in those areas uh, is is really high. Yeah, thank you. And it's quite a nice segue to my next question, which is uh, back to Peter. Actually, um, you know, uh, the stamp it out strategy isn't likely to work based on what we know now. Do you think the keep it out strategy is sustainable? Um, well, I think no is a short answer because I think um, this is going to be around for years and years. This isn't going to go away until it's not even going to get to low numbers until most of the world is vaccinated. And for instance, we don't even have vaccines for children yet. And that's not going to be realistic for children under 12, I think, for another year. So uh, if you're going to interact with the rest of the world and, and even if you don't, like at the moment, what overseas travels down 95%. We are still getting penetrations into the country that spread every now and again. And I think that will become worse with time because people will become less, more complacent. You know, with uh, people aren't as good now as they were a year ago with even keeping away from others when you're sick. So I, I think we need, need to make an effort to keep the numbers down as low as possible. And I think we need to stomp it when it comes. But if you ask me, do we think we can keep this out? No, I look at Taiwan or all those other countries. I think we need to keep our guard up. We need to do things that decrease transmission. Um, and we try not to stomp it out when it's here as much as we can. But um, I think as time goes on, that'll be less likely. But it won't matter as much. If we get everybody vaccinated, it should be vaccinated. Instead of having a thousand deaths, if it's spread, we'll get 50. And you've got to remember influenza, for instance, in a bad year in in you know 2017 something like 1300 people were documented as dying from influenza um you know and and we've been very good at keeping influenza out i might say also so, yeah. um if, at some stage we're going to have to accept a certain amount of risk we need to minimize that risk but i think one of the problems at the moment everybody wants to be the risk to be zero and forever zero and i don't think that's achievable no thank you and mark we've got um about 30,000 paramedics across Australia and New Zealand. That's a lot of fit testing. What, what's your recommendation around frequency? And secondly, is it possible to, to secure a seal with facial hair at all? 
some big questions there uh, put me on the spot <laughs> so um yeah so the as i put in the, the chat there the i guess the standard recommendation across australian iso and osha is an annual fit testing recommendation um, certainly, I, I put a link to some uh, page on the RestFit website showing a couple of studies where they showed, I think they followed people for about three three years um, and seeing about what kind of facial variation changes, people lost weight, gained weight, um, which sort of for the for the US and Ocean World, so I'd say probably most of people in fit testing in Australia uh, probably follow the OSHA protocol, just as it's sort of default in the in a lot of the port account machines and, and, and accessible. Um, so that sort of pins back by general best practice, but I know certainly on my own travels, I've seen different organisations will have chosen. That's all based on their own uh, assessment to what they're doing to do to, to yearly. I know more so in the industrial space from my experience, you know, just my, where I typically have, have dealt with, where they'll look at their similar exposure groups and for those workers that are, you know, over exposure standards or maybe they're in a higher risk environment, they would, you know, have that smaller percentage of people fit tested annually. And then with, you know, other people that are still requiring to wear respirators in a lower risk environment, they may choose to fit test them, you know, every two years or three years. But that's obviously going to be a individual organisation assessment for their for their people. Certainly, is logistical challenges, time, costs with that kind of number of people to be fit testing annually. But um, I certainly, you know, getting that, I mean, I guess a lot of time, you know, when I talk about fit testing, it's not just the process of doing the fit test that adds the value, it's that communication. I could do a fit test and not talk to the person they don't get any value out of the fit test other than, you know, the organisation have a bit of paper to say, yes, they can achieve a fit. But if that person doesn't understand why they're being fit tested, the purpose, when that protection is going to be there, like the, the value is not going to be there. So I'd say start the process and you may need to start with a longer time period until, you know, people's, you know, organisations resources can, can improve that, the frequency of time. But, you know, it's you don't want to forget till people don't know what they don't know. To, to do that so the, the value is you know hence why with respite it's that competence of the person and that education transfer it's only a short moment 20 30 minutes but that can make a big difference the amount of times i've fit tested people and just explain the concept all of it if, if whatever you're breathing in it's going to go around the filter and you're still going to breathe it anyway like you're still going to be breathing the stuff in and it's, it's scary sometimes that that like oh yeah that makes perfect sense doesn't it if it's not going to go through the filter we want that good seal so everything we breathe everything goes through the filter uh, answering your second question, can you actually achieve a seal with facial hair? Yes, it is. Yes, you absolutely. Not that it's theoretically impossible. A really good study I referred to was out of the HSC. Um, I mentioned about HSC do a lot of bunch studies and they did a particular, it's a number of years ago now, where they were fit testing a group of think about 10 workers over the course of a couple of week period. And every day they would fit test them as their facial hair grew, you know, depending on whatever that rate is. Obviously, we're all, all different. I remember friends in high school having a five o'clock shadow in high school. I still struggle with that today. So we're all different as far as how fast that facial hair grows. But in this particular group, they would say on day four or five, there would be a person who had their five days worth of growth and were achieving a seal on brand X. But then they would put them on brand Y and they weren't achieving a seal. So I guess it comes back to that term I used in my presentation. I think in the chat there is about predict predictability and reliability as well so yeah certainly someone may get a fit test on day x with x length of facial hair but that facial hair is going to grow a bit more tomorrow so it's a moving target when we think about that so what's reliable and predictable is being clean shaven have that confidence to get a seal you're not going to flip the coin and go oh, hopefully on day six they get us you know like so there's so much variability that comes into that so it's not that you can't but it's that we want reliability, you know, when we're going out to face whatever those contaminants are in the workplace or, you know, in the, in the healthcare sector. Yeah, thank you. Uh, reassuring for some of our uh, paramedic staff who do 12 and 14 hour shifts and certainly do get a five o'clock shadow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ed, our paramedic workforce is at the front line of healthcare. We see a lot of very sick people very early on in their um, condition or illness. What are your thoughts around um, the paramedic workforce um, and their role in perhaps early identification of, of new outbreaks? Um, it's, it's a tricky one because I think a, a lot of these um, zoonotic diseases, they present in a similar way. Uh, they can have very um, non-specific signs and symptoms, which does pose a threat to 
uh, frontline workers because uh, you know you might not know if it's flu or or COVID nineteen. You might not know um, um, what is actually going on behind those symptoms. And um, time is of the essence uh, when you're working uh, in paramedics. So. Um, often uh, those risks to, to self um, are kind of put to one side in, in those instances. Uh, so I think from, from my perspective, um, uh, there's, there's a really um, uh, big role in terms of uh, upskilling paramedics to know that there is a risk uh, for certain, certain kinds of diseases in certain contexts. Um, but also where, where there's this kind of extended scope, um, especially in rural and remote areas, there um, we, we're seeing paramedics working more closely with chronic illnesses, with people over time. So they're getting to know patients in the community. Uh, they're working closely with them. They have a good knowledge of their community, their context, uh, and the history of, of illness in, in a certain individual or family or community. So in those instances, that's where I think there's the opportunity to be able to um, work with authorities uh, and policymakers in um, learning about the potential for certain diseases in those local contexts. But it has to be a really uh, local and individualised approach, I think. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, Peter, we obviously have started a vaccination programme in the paramedic workforce now. Um, but we are seeing um, a lot of uh, staff needing quite a bit of time off following their vaccine. Just wondered if, if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, look, I mean, I think the thing that's got the focus in the media is the really rare bad side effect, you know, the, mm. the clotting, et cetera, which I might say is not that different to what you get with heparin, just to put it in perspective as well. But the ones that, um, that actually make people worry a bit is, is the fever, the aches, the pains. Now, my own experience, well, luckily my experience was that I didn't get much, so <laughs> I'm quite, um, but you know, from people working around me, you know, I get the impression that about 20% of people, one in five, get quite a significant reaction with fever and that makes them feel crook for four hours or even a day or two, you know, more or four hours. So. And perversely, at least in my limited experience at my hospital, Canberra Hospital, it seemed to be more often with the Pfizer vaccine than the AstraZeneca. But, you know, um, so look, I think it's quite expected that people may well have to take an afternoon off work um, or even a day. I, I'm not sure I agreed with one place I, I saw. They mainly got their staff vaccinated on Friday so that they didn't lose time off work, which I thought was yeah. a bit unreasonable personally. But yeah. Uh, I think, you know, expect it. I mean, I think you can treat it with Panadol, you know, treat the symptoms. Um, uh, perversely, the only good news about it, if you have a, a reaction like that, it means your immune system is working and you're responding to the antigen and it probably means you've got a good immune response going. But I'm not quite sure I've seen any data to say you have more protection if you have more reactions. But I think it's, you know, you get exposed to something that your body is reacting to and it's a sign that you're making antibodies and white cells. So um, while it's, you know, inconvenient for, you know, for most people for a few hours or a day, um, you know, I think don't be surprised if it happens, is basically, mm. because I think 20% of people will have that. One of the lessons we learned um, was that um, don't vaccinate a whole shift at the same time, because they might not be turning up on the next shift. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very wise uh, idea. You stagger it. Yeah. Stagger it, absolutely. Um, this is my final question, and it's it's for you, Mark. I'm putting you on the spot once more. Sorry about that. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, intense use of PPE um, is starting to uh, have an impact um, on our environment. Just wondering what your thoughts were in relation to the disposal or re, you know moving to more reuse reusable PPE. I mean sustainability of all PPE, you know, as we become more aware and the impact um, of, of of that is um, certainly critical. I know, I mean, I can obviously speak from a three M perspective and some of the you know as as a company committed to sustainability, but I guess some of the challenges when you look about respirators, you know, we talk about disposal broadly. That obviously a, a respirator is now captured. A contaminant, you know, whether it's asbestos or lead, so it's not just a case of let's go bury it in the ground and let it break down over over time. You know, it's, it's, it is treated as clinical 
waste potentially in the healthcare environment or treat it as, you know, as asbestos containing material. So when it comes to respirators or other type of PPE that may be contaminated with a thing, you know, um, it would, it's sort of, so it's, it's that, yeah, challenge in that space, but certainly seeing the range of surgical masks that are floating down, you know, different drain ways from people and that there certainly needs to be, you know, a lot of effort, you know, as, as an industry, look at how those type of materials can be more sustainable in front of that breakdown, but also sourced in that point of view. But certainly the contamination, you know, how you treat that is the key yeah. factor of where you put that, install that and where that goes then, uh, yeah, in that, in that point of view. So certainly is an area, I know 3M as a, as a company, broadly sustainability is, is, is a key thing to focus on. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you. So, um, I'd like to close out by again thanking um, all three of you for your presentations today and taking the time to spend with us. Um, we, um, uh, you know, infection control and managing COVID and post COVID is front of mind for us, and your, your insights have been really helpful. So, thank you for that. For our audience, uh, thank you for attending. Great to have you all. Um, I want to thank uh, Neen, um, the manufacturers of many of your uh, clinical medical bags for sponsoring today's webinar, making it uh, so we can make it free to all those of you who are watching it. So, uh, Neen, thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate it. And then next month on the 29th of June, again, another free webinar, looking at sustainable ambulance with Alexis Percival. Um, Alexis is a environmental and sustainability manager for the Yorkshire Ambulance Service. And the Yorkshire Ambulance Service is probably one of the leading uh, NHS trusts in relation to putting a sustainable um, ambulance strategy in place. So really looking forward to hearing from Alexis next, next month uh, to support the CAA sustainability strategy. So in closing, uh, thanks for your participation. Thanks for your questions. I hope you got as much out of those three amazing presenters as I did. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you for attending the Infection Control post-pandemic webinar in partnership with Neen. Join us for our next webinar on Thursday the 29th of June for Sustainable Ambulance with Alexis Percival. In the meantime, be sure to follow us on social media, Twitter at the Council of AM1 and LinkedIn, Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia to keep up to date. Thank you and we'll see you next time.